Hey, good morning. We'll call this morning's meeting to order. First thing on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. I move. We have a motion to approve the agenda. Second. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Approval of the payment of bills and vouchers. Ready to review them? So move. Second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second to approve the bills and vouchers. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Mr. Chair, do you want to just touch on citizens to be heard? I could do that a little bit. <laughs> Rocky might want to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> you have any citizens? Uh, Mr. Chair, I did have a conversation uh, with someone who put in a request in regards to questions about uh, daycare. Um, I did put them in contact with Rhonda Porter, uh, but just for the board's uh, perspective, I just want to mention that I did receive something that may be coming back, but I have nothing else for today. I also got a comment from a citizen that's concerned about a neighbor yeah, I thought he'd be here this morning but uh, I guess he's not here but uh, it's something we have to discuss I'll, I'll uh, talk to Matt and plan in a little bit more <coughs> see what's going on okay you Shannon yeah. good morning Shannon come and have a chair it's Shannon Fisher the guy I was just talking to that um, Rural area that's got a neighbor that's got some uh, horses next door and he's planning to build the fence next door. They're very, I've driven out there several times already, and uh, your neighbors are you're very close together. You got a neighborhood that's very close. Right. Well, you want to discuss what your concerns are? I guess I, I I would like to see you guys look into changes. You know, I've talked I think with Jenny mm -hmm. and uh, Matt. I'm gonna have, I got a horse pasture 20 feet from my house now. We sit out on our deck and it, the smell is horrendous, the flies are horrendous. Uh, and now on the, on the property line, which is 10 feet from my house, they're built, starting to build a fence and they're building this fence out of pallets. I guess my big concern is what, what is this gonna do to my property value? You know, having horses that close to my house and a, and a a pallet wood fence. I mean, it's just crazy to me. I apologize being late. I got stuck in traffic too. So, okay. I was out there looking at his property too. Yeah. His house faces east and west, and the neighbor's house is north and south. Correct. So, and the neighbor just put in a sort of like a feed lot almost, or right. with horses going right behind him, behind his house. So, which faces my my, right, right my house you. would face east, and their house is just south of me. Yeah, and he's he put a feed lot on the wall. You can call it a feed lot, whatever. He's got three horses in there. Two horses. They they wanted to get more, but two is what they're allowed for the acreage that they have or whatnot. Yeah. And I realize our planning commission they have the regulations that you can build your fence as long as it's on your property, but building it out of the building material that is used is probably not the proper use that you want your neighbor to do. But uh, and I don't know what we can do about it or what we can change our our ordinances and planning or not. You know, you know, and I, I guess my my main objective here is that you know I understand that's your ruling. I'm I'm probably out of luck with this matter. You know, it's they're following the rules. But my objective is so this doesn't happen to somebody else in the future. You know, I understand we're in the country, but we're in a little development of four houses too. You know, it's yeah. Have your uh, you and your neighbor sat down and discussed this? Have we? Yeah, that's she is very very hard to get along. With. They've uh, they've been threatening to sue me and. I talked to an attorney and there's several several cases with them in that attorney's office and that's and that's the scary part too. Like I say, it's, she's very wants
wants to sue everybody for any little thing. And she threatened to sue me that I had to pay for the fence or whatnot. And I'm like, what? I don't want a fence. I'm in the country. Why do I have to pay for a fence? So then in turn, I went to, I, I have a building maintenance company and uh, one of my biggest accounts is O'Keefe Law Firm. So I went right away to them and talked to them. And there were several cases and he laughed at me because I wouldn't give my attorney's name and whatnot. <clears throat> See, they, they got mad at me. They, they took it all out of proportion. I went to the, I started this process. I went to the Spring Prairie meeting. I went to several of them, and I explained to them, too. I said, I understand that they're following the rules. There's nothing I can do. And I love horses. My mice aunt raises horses and breeds them. And they took it all out of proportion that I'm trying to get their horses taken which I'm not because they're following the rules. But then that's when she just went absolutely crazy. And I think that the horse is almost closer to his yard, his house than their house. Oh, definitely. Definitely closer to my house than their house. <clears throat> Another one of those unique situations. I don't know meeting with Matt and see if we can do something different. It's tough to change the ordinances in the middle of the road. Right. But Mr. Chair, uh, if I can, so you mentioned you're in a, uh, is it like a subdivision of four homes or? It's, it's just four homes in a, in a corner. Of a a quarter section, okay. There's actually five, but the one older gal is kind of further back, you know, a quarter mile away. But there's four there's four houses kind of in an L right together. Okay. You know, I, you know, I, I'm assuming, you know, and I, I our chair mentioned that I'll talk with, with uh, Matt, our planner, but I'm assuming that they're, they're probably operating within what is currently acceptable uses, right? right? And so then it becomes, um, you know, do we, do we need to look in certain instances based on, um, you know, situations? Do you do you do you modify the restrictions in those areas a little bit? And again, but that that whole process would have to be vetted through the planning commission, you know. Um, and then, of course, then it would that could have an impact on our development code and everything else that that we have going on. So. Um, I guess what I'm telling you, it's going to be a, it's going to be complicated to right. to do it. But I, I I certainly respect that you're here and you're raising those concerns. And and I, I guess if I was a homeowner too, depending on what type of you know what type of fence is built, I mean that 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 in itself could be a um, you know, do we just, do we just allow anything to be used as a fence? Yeah, I mean I I would love to build a wood six eight foot tall picket fence. I mean, if I could afford it, but it's, it would have to be 500 feet long. Sure. You know, yeah. Because at, at this point, I would just, I would love to be just divided from that. You know, they got cameras that are, are showing their horses or whatnot that are right on the deck to my house. So um, I appreciate that you came today because I think it brings to light an issue that a lot of people are having rurally, um, sometimes in, in dealing with neighbors and understanding that we all choose to live in the country so we don't have some maybe rules that would regulate us like the city, but it's still issues arise. And um, I, you know, I think I, it's helpful that you're working with Matt because oftentimes we have these issues coming forward to the planning commission and, and you'll talk about maybe having setbacks or fences required and, and it, people just think it's another nuisance that's just you know a government restriction. But the reality is it's a lot of times to protect the po property owner adjacent like you're talking. And, and I'm hopeful that um, maybe working through Matt and the planning commission, we can adjust some some components here just to have a uniformity and and understanding it, it wouldn't be a code but um you know how the ordinances address the setbacks and and the scent line i mean we've we've talked about that if you don't have you know it might not be a feedlot with a thousand animal units but it still could have the same 
um, scent issue. Uh, the manure management still needs to be an issue that we work with with the SWCD and, and um, uh, the feedlot um, feedlot officer there to make sure that that's being followed because those are the areas that that you can can kind of keep us up to date on that as well if it, if those pieces aren't being followed sure i think it's unfortunate that her house faces the other way from your house their house faces south right and yours goes east and west and uh and she made it almost well that the lot is going all the way across the north south all, i mean all the way east west behind her house correct all the way up to the road and it's just uh um just an un unique situation and it's just uh, uh i mean she's abiding by the code two animals she's abiding by the code putting a fence on her on her property it's all on the ordinances you know and it's just it's tough for us to go and say you can Okay, you, can't. And then, you know that like I say that was kind of my objective I think right. unfortunately you know it's probably a pain to do but to me to be able to build a, a pallet fence is just absurd I mean man yeah you having to put up with a unique situation so, uh, the only I think the only thing I can do is meet with Matt you know and see if we can come up okay. with some cool. some sort of situation uh, uh, Bring it up at the planning and planning commission meeting and uh, see, see if we can do something about it. You know, well, there should be some limits placed on if you do have horses. You know, I mean, they do bring up a little bit more of a smell or whatever you want to say than some other small animals like two chickens or two ducks or something like that. You know, it's just yeah, like we used to sit out in the evenings on our deck and you know have a beer. I have a little. I got a little bonfire pit now. The the flies just eat you alive yeah well, Shannon right now I guess we can, it's not on the I mean it's not on the agenda but we'll, I think we'll see if we can do something for you you know okay. but, uh, I don't know it's a tough well, one and like I say you know I understand you know they're following everything there's nothing I can do for myself I'm sure but it, you know to keep something like this happening in the future to <clears throat> all said it happens too well, probably there's still going to be something done about smell and stuff like that. I don't know. I don't know if we can or not, but. In the past, that's been part of feedlot. And, yeah. and there's certainly that piece of nuisance. Um, maybe there's something within that that can be uh, looked at. We'll take a better look at it and see okay. if we can do something for you, Sean. Perfect. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Shannon. Thanks. Shannon, does uh, does Frank have your number, Shannon? Yes, I do. Okay, I'll, great. I'll call you. And, and Shannon, I did Matt Jacobson. I know you've been talking with him. He just he said he'd certainly be happy to meet with you again if that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to have Matt here. Just I forgot to call him this morning. That when I found out last yesterday that Shannon's going to be here, so. That's for the record, Santa, Shanna Fisher. Okay. Approval of the minutes for July 25th. So move. Got a motion? Second. Is that a second? Approve the minutes for July 25th. Just wanted a clarification in the minutes. Um, it references the discussion that we talked about the flooring at the resource recovery and I talked about how heating the area was not the best option I guess I don't recall exactly my comments talking about heating the area per se but um, I think what I was talking about was the SWAC committee talked about all of the options that were presented so just to expand it to not just heating because I think my comments talked about we we're trying to evaluate all the situations you want a correction made on this then or I would I would like to wordsmith it a little bit just so that it's not specifically heating okay probably get together and see what she needs <clears throat> I guess my request to amend what the motion would be would just be that um, 
that we discussed at SWAC, uh, the options, and agreed there was um, challenging issues. Um, so then to say that that was an unanticipated expense to ensure the safety of staff and citizens. Okay, Tag, if you can make that correction. Thank Makes you. Makes sense. Sorry. Okay, all in favor of the motion? Aye. With that correction? Aye. 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 Okay, Rocky. Presentation of the West Central Water District. Results and request approval to extend footprint within Clay County. Good morning, I'm Rocky Schneider with AE2S and online we have Stephen Slick um, also on my team. And just wanna make sure that Stephen is, um, can hear us and we can't see you, so if you could acknowledge, there we go. Yep, good morning everyone. Said the mic was breaking in and in and out a little bit, so um, if I'm delayed, that's why. And maybe if I could just start with a quick update on where we're at, I know you guys, give good updates every week, but just sort of a preface to this work. The West Central Regional Water District has been meeting as a working group with uh, Commissioner Campbell and Commissioner Gross on a monthly basis. I think we've had three meetings now, and things are going well. Uh, next Tuesday, we have the Senate bonding tour is coming to Halstead to talk about the bonding request that was made for a little over $9 million. So I think that's exciting that they're coming all the way up to Halstead. And, um, everybody's invited if, if you can make it. Um, I know we invited you know, the two representatives here, but if anybody else is interested in coming, please let me know and we can make sure we have um, accommodating factors. Is, you say this next Tuesday? I think it was Tuesday the 14th. Yeah. Pretty sure it's at 10.30 in Halstead. It'd be tough for us to make it. If we... <clears throat> yeah, understand that. That's why I declined, I wish. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. And so I think our goal, I mean, we have people to to cover the appropriate, you know, venue, but it's really just about showing sort of support. Right. And so uh, just, the to, just, uh, just a Rocky, point of clarification, Rocky, you did, you did send, yeah, August 16th at 1030 oh, to 1130. Yeah. yeah. It'll be a Wednesday. Sorry about that. I was off. Just a clarification, uh, the invitation, uh, Senator Johnson and Kupak would be... I think we've discussed that a little bit, just to extend that invitation, and then um, Representative Keel, who has Northern Clay County as well, and Representative Joy and Keeler as well. Sure, we'll we'll make sure to do that. I think we have a meeting with Rep uh, Senator Johnson coming up. Great. And we're working on the Kupec meeting. Okay. And so, Thanks. But yes, that's that's our our goal to make sure they're well okay. aware of the request and that their colleagues are coming up here. Thank you. Okay, so the meeting is on Tuesday. Yeah, it must be. It's on Wednesday? Wednesday, the 16th. Yep. Right. Oh, it's on Wednesday. All right. I don't get to bring my phone in, so I don't have my cheat sheet of my calendar. <laughs> it's also crazy. So I, was, I was going off that. But no, so it's, uh, you know, that's, that's really positive. And I think the best positive news, news we have from that is that we're in the, the House budget for $3.5 million for two different uh, federal earmarks through com uh, Congresswoman Fishbach's office. Uh, 1.75 for the city of Felton and 1.75 for Norman County. And so I think those working together is a pretty good seed money to get things started. And hopefully that uh, really helps convince the state that this is a project that's moving forward and so they will put in funding as well. And I think that's kind of the update we hope to sort of leverage to get that, that state participation as well. So that's, that's, those are sort of the major updates. And so uh, I think it's good moving along, but I think what we're really waiting for is to file the judicial paperwork to um, go through that process. That's you know a year-long process. It's really kind of the bottleneck, and and what we're waiting for is to come up with the final resolutions and the final boundaries. And so that brings us back to why we're here today. Um, Norman County has decided that their whole county they haven't changed anything. Their whole county is going to be in the rural water district. Holt County made some changes. They had an initial portion. They decided to expand their boundaries to everything that's not in the Marshall Polk rural water district. So their whole county will be in a rural water district, just split between two different ones. And so Clay County is, is the last act not, not far off. And so what we're hoping to do is if you take action today, we'd probably come back with a final resolution and a map or an updated resolution and a map just to make sure all three counties are approving the exact same document. So when it files in the court, it's very easy for the court to understand that everybody's aligned. And so I guess just for the process sake, does that make sense where we're at and what 
decision is in front of you, and then we can talk about the work that was done. I was reading it over, and are you saying that Eulen Township is not in favor? Or? Yeah, so maybe just a quick step back. So what we tried to do with this survey, you know, there's different reasons to do surveys. You know, like political surveys, you're really trying to force an opinion, trying to, you know, get an answer. Um, I know Commissioner Campbell and I were involved in a, a diversion survey that we were really trying to figure out people's usage of how they consumed media so we could reach out to them better. And so, you know, you're really trying to get feedback. With this one, it's more about uh, like trolling for a certain type of fish. You don't really want to force everybody to answer because you know most people probably don't know anything about it. And so what you're really looking for is, is there interest? Are there people that are going to come out and be like, oh, I have water problems? You know, and so trying to validate what we're seeing from the data and the arsenic and things like that. And so what we found is, you know, of the people that responded, we have 95% or so that were responded positively. We did have some negative ones, and part of that was from a, a mailing we did to all township officials. And so we actually had a couple negative responses from township officials in Eulen, Elkton, and Felton townships. Um, you know, we didn't get a lot of reasons why. It just was not needed at this time. You know, nobody really sort of had like a very strong emotional negative type reaction. It was just a, you know, we didn't have a lot of information on there. It was a no and we don't need this type, type response. The reason I asked that because I was at the Eulen City Council meeting last night. And they did seem interested to me. It seemed like they had some interest in it, you know, because they said they had some water plant problems and whatever. Yeah, and that's, you know, it's interesting, obviously, with Felton as well. You know, the mayor of Felton and the city of Felton have been a very active partner in this, and they're the ones getting, you know, some federal dollars coming in. So the city of Felton as well. So there's this converse between the township and the city. Um, you know, we've gotten positive responses in all those townships as well. And so it it's probably needs a further conversation, but where we're at at this snapshot in time, that's the information we have. So yeah. I mean, ideally, we go out and try to resolve, okay, what, where's the disconnect? Um, but That's why, I like, if we're going to do something today, we'd like to include the and Township in it, too. I would like to include the whole. Sure. Mr. Chair, if I, if I can, too, I, you know, I, you know, and it's, we have, quite a group or variety of people that serve on this uh, West Central group. And, you know, in, like the mayor of Hendrum says too, you know, that there, there's some really important needs and, and um, there's certainly interest in it, but it all boils down to the final findings. And, you know, how, how much does it cost? Uh, do I have to partake or not partake and all those types of things. and. And kind of what we've talked about is that that um, this whole deal would be a um, user paid for project. So if you're gonna, you know, if you want the rural water, then you're gonna you're gonna be the ones who are paying for it. I I think early on, I I'm not surprised that maybe that there's some uh, township officials who might uh, have expressed. Uh, negativity or, or reserve regarding the project for one thing you know um, these water lines got to go somewhere and uh, so you know I'm sure you start talking about the producers and are they concerned or are, are, are our lands going to be taken for there's all sorts of things that can come up but but that those answers and those things can can all be worked out you know um, and, and it might mean you know, you, you, you mentioned our diversion project. It's been going on for a long time. And, and guess what? The original channel changed quite a bit. It went from one state to another. And, and then even with that, there's been all sorts of alignment changes that have been done through the process. So, but, but to suggest that we, we shouldn't look at an option for people in rural areas throughout Clay County who have potential arsenic contamination and other things, the ability to have a, a potential source down the road. I agree with Frank. I think the more we've done this, uh, and we, we can t talk a little bit about more about that in a minute when we try to determine what what part of Clay County should be included. But I, you know, one of the things that that we've said, and and for communities like Eulen or Hall or Barnesville, even though the proposal might include them in the geographical area. They have the ability to opt out. 
Every, every city will have the, avail the ability to opt out and it won't apply to them. Um, and of course we still have <clears throat> to make sure of before, we, before this group could um, offer, we have to make sure that we have, have all the adequate supply um, for all of those communities. And I'm not so sure that just the current plan without adding some additional areas of supply would be sufficient to do all of Clay County. And those are all, all the things that we continue to talk about and, and work on and hopefully come up with solutions for. Um, but I, I, I guess I, even though there are some people who have concerns, you know, I, I think it's in the best interest of Clay County uh, to, to be involved with this as opposed to bow out and, and then later on when it becomes, uh, when we find the need for it, it becomes more difficult to join. Um, so, um, you know, so with that, I'll, Rocky, I, maybe I've kind of gotten in, into a little bit more of your presentation, but I, I really think that this, those are some key issues that people need to know, and I'm <clears throat> not one bit surprised that there might be people who have negative thoughts on it right now because they, they don't have all the information. So. Yes, and I, I think all that's very correct, and you've been very involved, so you could give this presentation as well. And I think a couple of things we learned throughout this process, um, Steve Larson joined us at a meeting with Moorhead Public Service, and it, we got a very positive response from them as well. You know, some of the things, challenges of including the whole county, for instance, would be, you know, is, is there a water source, as you mentioned? Um, Moorhead said they'd be more than open to talking about that. And so looking at areas south of sort of Highway 10, all of a sudden open, open up a lot easier. You know, obviously there's still a lot of deals and negotiations and, and engineering that goes into that, but that sort of opened the door to, okay, now this is a technical possibility as, as well as just a good feasible option. But I, I think you were mentioning, just so everyone's aware, the, the sort of ease of entering the district is much easier now than it is later. And so once you file the judicial paperwork and the court determines what the boundary is, you know, if it's the whole county, then cities can opt in if they want. If they don't opt in, there's no cost, you know, nothing, nothing to it type thing or residents as well. Um, after, the, after the fact, you then have to go back to the courts and it's a whole, you know, then who pays that cost? And so right now it'd be the county sort of stepping up on the front and saying, you want to give this option to everybody. So they have options when that time comes because every community has a different life cycle of whatever they're doing for their water system right now. And so if you just put in a water system 10 years ago, it's still good. You probably don't, this isn't high on your list, but maybe in 20 years when the time comes, it's nice to have another option out there. So Rocky, I, I think in addition to that, though, one of the, one of the a key component there, you said it might be judicial that they'd have to go through to get ad, added later, but it could also be that the the governing board that is going to be established as a result of this, which would include members from all three counties, you know, it's it's going to it's going to require their acceptance. Of a of somebody who wants to expand their territory later, and you know th there's no guarantee. So, for example, if we chose, you know, just the top half or the, the townships from Highway 10 north, and now and then we wanted the township south of Highway 10 later, there's no guarantee that they'd ever get in, that they'd ever be accepted. Whereas right now, if we do this, you know, everybody's in, but you still have the option to opt in or opt out in terms of the actual service itself. Yes, that's correct. We have, we've all been on the wrong side of a vote that we think might be easy. <laughs> I guess the one question I have, and, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, we say it's just a user fee, but now Felton got 1.75 million, Norman Crown got that one. What is that money for? What are they gonna use that money for if it's just their user fee? Yeah, you know, I, I think with most of these rural water projects, we are, you know, if we work with a community, we're going to try to maximize grants as much as possible. And so anytime somebody decides to do a project that expands the rural water district, we're going to go through all options, right? You're going to go through, you know, the PFA in Minnesota to try to get the best financing or funding options there. You're going to go to the legislature and try to get funding. You're going to go to USDA rural development. You're going to go through this federal process. And really at the end of the day, whatever that local share ends up being, 
you know, to match that grant. You know, so that federal grant is an 80-20 grant. You know, that 20 percent still got to come from local, which is really non-federal, so it's either state or local. So and that's where the user fees come in. Okay, so you're talking about the pipes that are being laid that have to be paid for? Yes. Yes. Okay, so that's what the, what those grants are for, for the in, infrastructure, I guess. Yeah, and so, you know, you know, it's a, a great benefit to get a grant, right? Because that's right. Uh, free money is sort of. And so, you know, ideally that's the way we do every project going forward. We know there's going to be times where a rural resident just wants to connect. You know, that will be at their cost to connect in the future if they want to. They, there's options for them to go out and get grants or beneficial financing, but ultimately that will be, you know, at the user's cost. Okay. So, there, Mr. Chair, there's, there's really, you know, ultimately there can end up being um, a, a cost to the user for their share of the construction. Okay. It's over and above what would be funded through the federal and state grants. Okay, well, that, I guess that's what I wanted to clarify. And, that, and so, and, and that's, we also talk about, uh, about that. That's the intention, too, from everybody that's been within our committee, that everybody needs to understand that when you go through the process and say, yeah, we're interested, if Felton's interested in it, or if Eulen's interested in it, that local share has to be borne by the users or by that community. Uh, and that won't be the county's responsibility. Right. We've, we've, we wanted to make that clear. Um, obviously, and, we're going to be talking about an investment up front to to establish the district. I guess that's what I'm trying to say is yeah. I want to make it clear to them. Yeah, it's not just a user fee, but there's also infrastructure fee. That's right. There's a part that they pay to get it, and then there's the ongoing part that they'll have for using it. Yeah, once it's there, it's just a user fee. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, you know, it's a complicated process, and I think as the district gets formed, that board will have to make some decisions about, you know, if if they see a, a large need in an area, do they take on the debt and have that repaid through user fees, or is it a, a joint effort to get grants up front for it first? You know, and so, I mean, there's a lot of decisions that go into that, but... Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Go ahead. Excuse me for interrupting. <coughs> Yeah, no, you know, I think you guys have a pretty good grasp on the, you know, I think the key thing is sometimes what you don't find when you ask people questions, it's not so much the answers you get. Nobody told us that their water was so great this wasn't needed, for instance. Um, you know, some people just clicked no or whatever, but I think by far we had people that know a lot about the water they're drinking. You know, at the Holly Township, for instance, they may not know a lot about what a rural water district is, but they know a lot about their wells, they get them tested themselves. They understand that it's not the highest quality in a lot of areas or they have arsenic that they should be doing something about and a lot of the questions we got were how quick can this get there and you know those are the tough questions because it's not a quick process but um, it, I think that was important feedback to get as well but maybe the important thing to cover and I think you have it better in your packet than I do in my tech memo but um, is the population and what that means as far as cost and risk and so if you look at this this map with the numbers on it, that shows you know where you're at based on the resolution you've already approved. So the original resolution that was approved, Clay County made up about 20% of the population. And we've estimated with the, the lawyer at Flaherty and Hood that the whole judicial process costs roughly $300,000. Um, that was our estimate. You know, granted, this hasn't been done in full in 40 years through the Minnesota court process, so that's that's our estimate right now. And so you'd be, you know, on the hook, so to speak, for you know 20 percent of that, one fifth of that. But with Polk County expanding, you know, Clay County's population share right now, and your current resolution goes down to like 14 percent. I think it was 13.7 in here. But if you're looking at expanding to the entire county, other than what Moorhead Public Service currently serves. You know, Clay County goes up to that 49%, or roughly, you know, almost to the halfway mark of the $300,000. And so that's, that's what you'd potentially be um, committing to through the judicial process by including the entire county. Wasn't Polk County also considering going to the whole county, too? Yes, so they, they did. So their population goes from, you know, about 4,000 people in, in it to over 10,000. So they go up. So they... It's, it's kind of odd, but they remain at about 31% of the whole 
old district because they increase the same time if Clay County increases as well. Okay. So yeah, Clay County right now is the only county that's not entirely in the district. Yeah. Well, and along with Polk, I think so. Yeah. One of the, Mr. Chair, one of the one of the discussions that was made too, and and I, you know, I in a way I, from a governance standpoint, I, I you know, I think the other two counties were happy to hear that that you know Clay County might be considering bigger than what they usually originally did, because we, as we all know, when we go to um, put in applications for grants from a federal and a state purpose. Uh, the larger geographical area and the larger number of people that you're serving, you have a better opportunity to receive those grants. And so we, you know, that's also a, a positive by having this that your your ability to, you know, the state's going to look more closely at you if you're, if it's serving a larger area. So. Um. Yeah, I tried to put that in here under you know regionalization. The Minnesota, you know, the the PFA doesn't give priority to that yet, but I think they're headed that way. Most states are that regionalization is just for government services like this is so much easier on workforce, administrative costs, you know, state participation, everything. And so the, the, the politics of it do matter a lot as well. I think also we haven't mentioned that map yet of the showing the arsenic content, you know. I think if people get aware of what that arsenic content is, you know, there's a lot of Clay County Mm -hmm. It's got a uh, over 10% arsenic content in their water, and I think a lot of people aren't aware of that. Yeah, that's maybe where we could have started this whole conversation is you know really trying to figure out what the need is of the county, and that's what you have to prove to the courts. You can't just expand your boundary willy nilly, right? You have to prove there's an actual need, and I think we knew going into this the need was there. What we were trying to find is there's something out there that tells us there's not a need, you know, to try to prove the adverse and. We didn't find anything to that effect. So that map that's in there is probably still sort of, you know, exhibit A for the court process that there's a need all all up and down through the rural water district, not just in Clay County, but our yeah, state. I, serious. I think we have to involve the, the safety need of the water for the people of Clay County. Yes. Uh, not just the wa use of water, but the safety of the water that you have. Well safe safe and, and safe quality and quantity are all really important. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Paul. Where mm -hmm. did the data come from this map showing? I'm going I'm to ask Stephen on that one. He's been chomping at the bit to talk anyways. I bet. <laughs> the first Sorry, map, can, you, can um, you repeat that? Yeah. I just wanted to know where the data came for uh, the shading of this map. On yeah, the front. so... I see, uh, you know, when it comes down to certain areas, I'm, I don't want to be too picky here, but it, you know, I'm surprised it isn't, there isn't more actually. Yeah, so uh, good question. All the data um, that's reflected on the map that you're seeing comes from the Minnesota Department of Health uh, private well data okay. that the Department of Health has logged. Um, and then from that point, uh, an interpolation tool is used to kind of just fill it in the blank so it doesn't look like a bunch of little dots everywhere. Okay, thank you. Well, then it'd yep. be, uh, I mean, they certainly uh, test their wells enough to know. So. Yep. And we've really, well, we've really focused, focused on arsenic. It's certainly not the only thing out there. We have other maps that maybe aren't quite as extreme, but there's, there's areas of the county that um, have showings of other contaminants as well. You know, one one thing to kind of mention on that, um, throughout the Hall Holly Township, when they did their mailing, uh, I saw quite a few uh, responses of high levels of manganese. Um, right now, that's an SMCL, so secondary maximum contaminant level. Uh, and there has been some discussion from the EPA that will move that to a primary contaminant and the limits will be uh, likely lowered in the future. Um, We've seen some cities with that same issue as well. So there's there's many different contaminants that are out there, and different regions face different uh, challenges, whether it be arsenic, manganese, nitrates, nitrites, um, and now PFAS. So, and, and I guess with my funding background, I, I look at those two, and that's 
you know, the bipartisan infrastructure law has a lot of extra money right now out to states for emerging contaminants like manganese. And so when you hear things like that, it's, it's the right window of opportunity to try to be doing projects because there's an added investment from the federal level right now. Rocky or Steve, can you um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, one of the things early on in this that, that I think all of us expressed uh, some current concern on this was the governance piece and can so can you talk a little bit you know so originally Clay County was going to be in at maybe 20 percent and if we do if we do everything out without the or excluding just the area that's provided by more public service that number now goes to is it 49 percent so can you can you talk about um you know what the difference of of twenty percent governance is for Clay County versus forty nine percent too. Yeah, so you know we've had some conversations at our our working group about the final board structure, and it's based on the statute says based on population, and there's probably some clarity that's needed from that because this hasn't been done in a while, and looking at some of the other districts. But what what we had talked about as a working group is probably having a board of you know, nine people and breaking that up by population between the three counties to appoint members to it. And so we'd like to think once you get appointed to those things, you, you put on your hat as the district as a whole, but we all know how that works sometimes as well. And so, you know, Clay County, based on their population, would get 49% of those board seats. Does that end up being four of nine? You know, And, and according to the legal people that we had consulting with us, they said that that's in the statute required. Yes, is based on population. Yes. Yep. So, yes. you know, so it's not it, it's not an option because I, I, I I know at one point in there, uh, somebody had mentioned well maybe we should if we if we have a nine member board let's just have three from each county. Yeah. Uh, the, the statute doesn't allow that. Yep. The statute says it goes by population. Okay. You know, so I but I, I think that's important from our standpoint. You know that that we have a. Pro, a an appropriate representation on what would become um, a decision-making board. Even with that, I think the other counties were very supportive of Clay County putting as much as possible in sure. if there was a need. Right. You know, there wasn't pushback based on that. And I think the sort of um, sort of friend in in the water district just to the west across North Dakota said. You know, if you get appointed to do these things, you're putting in a lot of time. You care about rural water, and, and most of the time, it doesn't matter where you're from. You're making the right decision as a unanimous board. But there's times when those things are important as well. So it's a, definitely a consideration. And the, and the one last thing that I want to mention here is that th this this would be a a massive project that would take quite a bit of time. And, you know, so. At, uh, unle unless we were to develop something sooner that would have access, for example, in southern Clay County from across the river tapping in from some, a source that direction, or maybe from where public service or something, the likelihood is everything is going to go, the, the, it's going to go from north to south. That's, you know, it's pretty much how we're seeing this right now. Right now it's in Norman County, it's going to flow into northern, um, Norm, oh, it's going to Norman County. It's going to flow into Felton and Yulin, which is in the northern part. That those are kind of scheduled lines. And you know, I guess what I'm saying is, is somebody in in the far south part of Clay County, even if they really want this, they may have to wait a while. It's nothing that's going to happen. Yeah. Unless unless, unless we were to get a massive infrastructure. Um, I can right now. Now it's in Polk County. It's not even in North. It's not even. Yeah, in it's not even there yet. Yeah. Yeah, you know, north to south, or really, you know, west to east. You know, but it's in trying to get up the, you know, the banks of Lake Agassiz type thing. Then it the costs go up, and the geography makes it more difficult. But, um, yeah, going south for more public service is probably just as easy as yeah. you know bringing it down. But that'll be some tough decisions, I think, for the city of Felton as they get their money as we start to look into the what's the best route for them. You know, and how do they combine with Norman County to sort of share costs so they can maximize? I guess I just wanted to bring up that for some, this is yep. this is the start of something that could take some time for everybody to receive the benefit. And it's definitely, I mean, a visionary part on your guys's decision here to do this because I think we saw the maps. You know, the the west or the east central district in North Dakota. He showed some maps over a 50-year time period of just 
how it's built out, and it's you know now it's everywhere, but it does does take some time. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the important part is educating the people on the water quality of Clay County. Okay. Yes, some more to add, or I, I can keep talking, but I think yeah. you guys have a good grasp of uh, of the situation. I, maybe, maybe just for for clarity and importance right now, in terms of uh, you know, I, I certainly believe that that we should be including all of Clay County, with the exception of that. It basically amounts to excluding Moorhead and Dilworth because they have they have service provided by. Moorhead, Moorhead Public Service, and one of the issues is that you have to be able to prove is that there's a need. And Moorhead and Dilworth, we can't make that for them because they already have it, right? Mm -hmm. So so with that, you know, we're now we're, you know, we originally talked about from the funding standpoint, and this number now, uh, this cost deal is predicted or anticipated to be around 300,000. And so, you know, we had, if you recall, we had committed uh, hundred thousand dollars towards this and the board did in special ARPA funding uh, to you know to establish this take it through this this piece that we're talking about uh, if we take the entire county as, as uh, is indicated in our packet here that number could go to 147 thousand if 300 thousand was the number you know so so we could end up having you know, be short versus what those ARPA funds covered. I think this is something that's a, an important infrastructure thing. I think we could probably, if we had to at that point in time, if it did get to 300,000, we could look at reserves to even do that because it's, it's a, this is something that's a capital investment that's uh, for the good of all of Clay County in the future. But I, what, I, what I want to ask though is during this process, um, who has the authority to say, okay, well, this thing, you know, what, what if 300 becomes 500, you know, 500,000, you know, these are, these are projected numbers, but I've also seen projections just, you know, yeah, no, not what they are. That's a, a good and wise question. Um, you know, the, the rural water district is legally formed already because of the past resolutions that have been passed by the three counties. And so the three counties will have to jointly submit to the judicial process and working through the court system, you'll have a better understanding of what that is. And so there, there are probably a situation out there where if you got a you know, RFP for the certain type of work that needed to be done and it was exorbitant, the three counties could say, well, well this is not what we signed on for and, and be able to um, back out. And so you know, some of that's um, going a little bit of risk, obviously, anytime you do those things, but there, you don't, you're not being forced into doing it. Well, Mr. Chair, I, I live in the city of Moorhead, and my, and my I, the water I drink is really good, and and it's and it's safe. Uh, I don't I don't know that in some of the rural rural areas they can say the same thing. And uh, I think to move this thing along, because I do believe that this group is also one that wants some clarification and finalization on what Clay, Clay County wants for its boundaries. So uh, having said that, I, I would make a motion that, that uh, we proceed with um, the entire county with the exception of the area serviced by Moorhead and Dilworth to be included in the jurisdictional boundaries of this water district. I'll second that. Um, so as I read in our packet here, uh, just so we all know, I'm, I'm, I'm reading, reading that your motion as the option to a. Because uh, I'm, I, I'm, assuming that Dilworth I mean, is more in public service the same way that uh, Moorhead is. I think the data was weak to do yes. to b. Yes. Yeah. I, that that really option two a def yeah. defines my area. Yeah. So I'm thinking of this for reach. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, we've got a motion and a second to approve to all of Clay County except Moorhead and Dilworth. Any further discussion? Just a clarification. So that would be the boundary as it is today. And then would, as their boundaries increase, would then we need to readdress that or would that 
change with the verbiage. That's why I think we should go more toward the motion, or under 2A, because it just defines more in public service rather than a municipality. Does that make sense? Uh, I guess I'm trying to find out, how could the boundaries increase? Well, I, I, think I, I think what Commissioner Mo is saying is that right now, Mo 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 the end of Moorhead is right here, but what if Moorhead expands out a mile to the south? Does that area stay within or does it go without? Yeah, I, that becomes the area. But, but again, that would be defined because if that area, that one mile jurisdiction expanded, that would then be covered by Moorhead Public Service, so it would be excluded you know, under what option 2A would say. Yeah. Am I, am I correct in that? That's that's how. Yeah, you know, I my, I think this is probably a good question for um, Dan at Flaherty and Hood. Yeah. But I, there's nothing that precludes the district from overlapping with Moorhead Public Service. So, I mean, right now, if you set it where it's at now, if Moorhead Public Service and Moorhead, City of Moorhead expand, they might be in the district, but that doesn't, I won't say it doesn't matter, but it, it won't change anything. I think what it might change is if you do a future repopulation estimate, right. then that sort of you know creates a, a thing. But um, trying to figure out you know a better way around that, but I, I'm not sure there is. You have to pick a snapshot in time, and then you deal with that well, when that comes up. And, and again, you know, based on the conversations we've had today, so the the local municipality has the rights to to provide service yep. and if you know if we have an area of moorhead that or that's not moorhead now that's in our area and becomes moorhead moorhead then for that area then can opt out right that that would that would be the legal way that i understand it would be right now yeah the only the only thing would be is if if that didn't happen for the next 30 years and all of a sudden there's a rural water system that's brought into that area right. then there then there could be an issue that's that's uh over my pay grade certainly to figure out <laughs> you yeah know. you know there might be a need to be some future negotiations with more public service just to say you know and and and, and it very well could be that that would have to be spelled out in any agreement moorhead might have to provide water to rural areas you know, so that that's something that could be addressed in those areas. But it, overall, I think that you know, the I'm very comfortable with what you're saying because it's that extraterritorial area already, right? And we know that's going to be years in progress anyway, right? Yeah, right. The intent is not to compete with Moorhead Public Service. I think no, we don't want to do that. So how do you want the motion? I the, the way I the way 20%. I expressed it, which is basically in the packet two A. Okay, very good. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Post. Very good. Okay, motion passes. Uh, Mr. Chair, we'll be bringing back a resolution probably in a, in a couple of weeks, a uh, week or so. Uh, it's up to the board if, if it would just be an expansion of the current resolution. So I don't know if you want that on consent or if you'd like me to present it to the. I I, I think it should be presented. Okay. I, I don't. It's something like this important. It should not be on consent. I okay. Think, but. Okay. We'll, we'll get you an estimate once we talk to Dan. Lawyers sometimes take a while. <laughs> yes, that sounds good. Thank you, Rocky. Thank you. And Steve, thank you very much for being there. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Hopefully, see you next Wednesday. Okay. Okay, Rhonda. Jackie got the time wrong again, so it's okay.
There we go. <laughs> Falls in line with the whys and the hows of the 2024 budget. Um, so I thought I would start with the document I just handed out, um, <clears throat> labeled 2022 revenues over expenditures. Um, so for context, I mean, you know, the social service budget is, you know, 25 million and there's a lot of things that pass through social services budget that don't necessarily impact the levy or the the year end um, you know how we land revenues over expenditures so I'm really focusing on those programs and services that impact the levy request or impact the bottom line at the end of each year as you know sometimes mid-year we might get a grant and that grant might have a corresponding expenditure out so if those are equal they're not really impacting that bottom line so just know that my focus is a bit narrower than what the broader budget is um, so 2022 i thought i would just spend a few minutes going through why did we end up with 1.4 million dollars revenues over expenditures and there's quite an analysis um, we do in terms of looking picking apart that budget honing in on the areas that again uh, make that impact at the bottom line um, the first thing I like to do is look at salaries for our staff so I simply pull out of the 2022 budget what did we budget for salary and benefits for staff and then what did we actually spend and that 292,923 is that difference that means that we underspent in in that area by that amount we had four retirements in 2022 and 11 staff turnovers and as you know retirements create budget savings as as does turnover when we have positions that are open for periods of time people leave on higher steps of the scale and come in at lower steps of the scale so that is um, one significant impact to that bottom line um, then the second piece that i do in the budget is i pull out all of the administrative lines administrative um, expenditures are budgeted in four or three different places in our budget so i take all of those combined i take out the salaries and benefits i look at all of the administrative expenses that don't have grants attached to them those kinds of things and I look, I do the same thing. What did we budget and what did we spend? We actually were over budget in that area by 74,485. Um, second piece I look at is then I move down into program areas. I always pull out the auto home placements because that's a, a big budget item. Uh, we budgeted, budgeted in 2022, $2.5 million net for auto home placements. We were under that by 24,817. Um, so that was a savings to the budget for 2022. Uh, then I look at all of our purchase service costs. So again, these are um, purchase services that are not necessarily attached to grants. They are more so fee for service um, program areas where depending on the folks served um, will depend on what gets billed to the county for services. And out of all of those program areas, again, I look at what did we budget, what did we spend, and we were 473,000 underspent in program areas. Added a couple comments there, um, looking back over 2020, 2021, and 2022, uh, we still had influences of the pandemic in our program areas in particular utilization staff shortages um, those kinds of things do impact those program areas and they did in 2022 as well um, one side comment you'll notice i had some additional numbers um, to the right of that what i wanted to just highlight here is that when we set the budget for 2023 we did reduce program expenditures by 228,266. And moving into the 2024 budget, I'm reducing, proposing uh, an additional reduction of 114,500. So we are looking at 
what we actually, what was the actual end result of a budget and using that information to plan going forward. All right, and then um, the other pieces that impacted 2022 was we had some increased revenues in the amount of 335,331. Um, again, the numbers to the right reflect increased revenues that we added to the 2023 budget and the 2024 budget based on that trend. So we're um, kind of writing the, the budget a little bit more going forward. Um, and then the last piece that influenced the year end for 2022 is we had some unique revenues that were receded into 2022 that actually would be applied back to 2021. It's not uncommon that we have that. It's just timing of, of revenues. But in 2021 and 2022, we had larger amounts and we had DHS was slower on reimbursements. I'm not sure if it was pandemic issues, federal reimbursement issues, but we have that's, that were a bit unique from year to year. So that 431 um, are revenues that would have been applied to 2021, and we had revenues in 2021 that would have went to 2020. But again, they were unique. So um, that's kind of a summary of 2022 and, and how that ended the way it did. Questions on that before I go to 2024 proposed? Oh, you got us confused. Keep going. I know. <laughs> the conversation before mine was Greek to me. This is not so. <laughs> well, I, I, I really appreciate what the document you just gave us. That was good information. Okay. Yes. Good. Good. Thank you. Go ahead. One quick question. So, of that, um, in its in those ten. Is your mic on? No. Sorry. Uh, just a quick question, because it was here in those pandemic years, was there money that you're taking as revenues that don't exist anymore? In other words, did it come out of heirs or federal monies or, you know, I mean, atypical type of monies yeah. that don't exist any longer? Um, in small amounts, yes. However, um, if you look at the increased revenues to 335, mm -hmm. where that plays into is that for our billable services, particularly for Medicaid, we did over the pandemic years get increased um, revenue from that. So it's more, it was based on our activity. So at prior to pandemic, we maybe got 50%. During pandemic, we got 53 point, you know, so we, we got some increased federal participation that did increase our revenues. And that will not be going forward. But it was in huge amounts, it doesn't sound like. Well, it, you know, it added up. There was a, a fair amount there, but there was also some of this 335 was, um, uh, you know, other allocations that came in a little bit higher than we anticipated. Some grants, we got a couple grants that um, increased that helped us pay for some of the staff that we have involved in those programs. So, yeah, it was a variety of things. I, I didn't mean you're confusing this, Rhonda. This is a good report. Okay, Go good. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad to see that you're coming forward with this revenue that you're getting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so 2024, um, I'm gonna speak from this uh, document here. And, um, you know, as you know, I, I think our budget pages is, I'm not sure how many pages we got there, maybe 25 pages. So I go through that in its entirety and then I'm providing a summary, but we certainly can go into any lines that you might um, see appropriate. But I usually start off by just giving kind of a levy summary. So in our 2023 levy request was 13 million uh, 3823. Um, the board decided to use 350,000 of fund balance to set the levy at 12,688,23 for social services. So when I compare what am I requesting for 2024, I compare it to what I requested, not reducing that um, uh, fund balance piece. So 
the analysis that I have is for 2024, I'm requesting 13644810 in a levy, um, which represents 1.23% increase from um, last year. The one piece that was, or actually, I'm sorry, the 13. 13,198,935 is what I'm requesting, which is the 1.23%. But the piece that's currently in the 2024 budget is a substantial increase for detox, and that's that 445,875. So right now we budget a um, little over 700,000 for detox. So basically detox sets their budget, they, um, reduce it by any revenue, and then whatever that operating difference is, it gets billed to the social service budget. So right now we have that as 700,000. However, with the expansion and the new facility, um, we added 445,875 to that budget just as a placeholder, a piece for discussion going forward as we make a decision about how best to budget detox going forward. So, questions on that? Were there any additional revenues considered for the detox facility other than expenditures? You know, I am still, um, they're still doing their analysis on some of their withdrawal management revenues, and so I think that's the piece we have to look at over the next couple months going forward as to how those revenues might look going forward and whether that would change the proposed because budget. because you know what we've been told is is the services that are going to be provided are going to now allow for um, quali qualifying for external um, state benefits or whatever that can help fund that so and i and i don't know that any of that's been included yet yeah, I think we might want to schedule a separate board discussion specific mm -hmm. to detox as we go forward and look at those revenues. I know that they are billing for withdrawal management, which is the added piece. That, and that's something new. Yes, yeah. Right. And they've been, they have been billing for that for a while. Um, and so we'll be able to kind of project that, what that might look like with the increased population. The increased beds, yeah. yes. Increased beds. Okay. And, Thank you. That's... Yeah. Yeah. But for now, we kind of put that 445 in there but um, so with the 445,875 if the board were to approve that and the board were to decide to keep it in the social service budget then the levy request would be that 13,644 but I backed that out for the sake of conversation um, in terms of the rest of the social service budget um, so right now my request sits at 13198 That's an increase of 160, approximately 161000 at 1.23%. So, and then I have the detail as to that below. Um, before I get into that, I do have two new requests in the budget, which are two social work positions. Um, I did provide some documentation of the need for that in your board packet. I did schedule August 22nd to come before the board with my supervisors to talk in more detail about those positions. And so I didn't intend to go over them um, as much today, but they are in, in the budget as new requests. And so if the board were to approve those, that would bring my levy request to 13327840 for 2.22%. So that's kind of summary. <coughs> so are you staying at as far as employment? Are you at full capacity now? Or should we say? We are one staff down okay. right now, and um, I think I have that after this presentation to request approval to fill. Okay. Actually, no. Well, yes, one staff down. We do have one other turnover um, for an office support specialist. So. Yeah. Yep. Okay, and then I just made a note in here. The current fund balance for social services is 11,103,331, just for knowledge. So the last um, 
section there, budget items most impacting the levy. So again, what I did was I took 20, this is budget to budget. So I took 2022 budget. What did we budget for salaries and benefits? And then what am I budgeting for 2024? Um, and that is an increase of 275,656. Now that includes 3% COLA, steps, and health insurance. That's covered in that 275,000. Um, we have some smaller increases to, so um, in the social service budget, we, the county attorney's office, we support the work that the county attorney's office does for social services. So we have a slight increase there. Um, county funded burials, um, our trend is trending a bit high and I feel like we need to increase our um, amount that we budget for county funded burials by 20,000. Excuse me, while you're talking about that, uh, as I was reading this, what involves a county burial? What constitutes a county burial? So it's individuals that reside in Clay County that pass away who are uh, low income or indigent and have no funds to pay for a burial. And so the family or the funeral home can make an application on that um, deceased's behalf. And then we go through and look at, um, you know, any assets. We look at income. We look at um, all kinds of things to determine whether they would qualify for a county funded burial. And then we work with our local uh, funeral homes on establishing um, rates for services for folks that need a county funded burial. Okay, thank you. And that's, we're required to provide that service under statute. And so I do think that we'll want to look at um, some slight increases to what we've approved to pay for the funeral homes as well. We usually apply at least a cost of living percentage to. Yeah, because I see it was, was 202,000 last year, so. Yeah, we had, it was a little uh, unusual. We had a large, unfortunately, family um, that, we served in 2022 um, that increased those expenses. But even our 2023 year to date trend at 92,000, um, I think you know, we need to consider that. I didn't jump it up all the way based on what I knew for 2022, but we wanna kind of keep that in pace because no matter what we budget, if, it, if a family or individual is determined eligible, we pay for it and we do it, so. Um, so that's why I added 20,000. And then contractor provider increases, 41,637. And then that second page gives you a bit of um, a summary of, of which contracts um, I did apply a percentage increase to. Um, this last year, I don't always reach out to our contractor providers and have them tell me what they think they need based on trends. I did this year, um, and so I tried to honor what those providers were feeling that they needed in order to maintain that level of service that we're contracting for, and that's what I put here. So that represents that 41637 and a, a note on a couple of these, particularly a place for hope and Transem, um, they serve folks with mental health and our adult mental health initiative is getting some additional one-time funds that will carry over into 2024. And so it's possible we may fund those increases with that adult mental health initiative. And so then I could back that out of this budget. So we'll see if that transpires. And then that would be a savings to the budget, of course. Um, auto home placements, I increased. We've been budgeting a net 2.5. I did increase that, that to 2.55 million. Um, and actually, our trend would suggest that it probably should be higher than that. However, um, it's a piece I think we'll want to watch over the next couple months and see if... if um, 
that proposal should stand or if that should look a little bit differently. But our expenditures, it's not that our expenditures are running higher, it's that our revenues are reduced. And the biggest part of that is we are no longer able to claim um, for federal reimbursement for some of the costs at West Central Regional Juvenile Center. And it's because um, they're not considered what's called a QRTP, a Qualified Residential Treatment Program for Mental Health. That would require some additional certification. And it appears as though because they have a secure side to their facility that it would exclude them from being this QRTP certification. So we're still kind of working that through, but it looks like we will most likely lose some of that revenue going forward because of that. If I can, Ron and Mr. If, if you can. So in regards to that, though, the uh, when when we expanded the West Central Regional for population base and we added that one component there, it, it did allow us to keep some of our kids locally as opposed to, to sending them out, which was a much more expensive process, right? So, so even though we might be losing a little bit of federal money, uh, based on what you just talked about, yep. The overall benefit to Clay County is that that we've been able to keep kids here, and there's still a savings yeah. to the to the social service budget. Yeah, we I mean we still think it's it's uh, uh, the expansion of services and keeping our kids here close to their families and school district and service providers is the best thing we can do. Um, so when we kind of weighed those pros and cons to this, I think that's where we landed as well. Right. Um, it's something we'll want to keep looking at to see if there's other alternatives that we could do to address the revenue side, but. Thank you. Yep. And then um, I did increase our adult mental health civil commitments and hold orders. You can see the history on the second page, um, the second grid from the bottom. We. You know, if you look at what we spent in 2022, 733,000, and we only had budgeted the 580, I only have budgeted 580 for 2023, I felt the need to um, increase that fairly substantially to keep pace with what's really happening in that program area. Um, but then on the side from that, I was able to reduce some other program areas, so it kind of netted, netted out a little bit. So then you'll see the program expenditure reductions, 114,500 with the detail on the second page. Totally took out merit system. As you know, starting in January 2023, we're, we're out of merit system and no longer having to pay those costs. And then we had some revenues that I felt that we could increase based on um, history and that created um, a savings of 186,491. Um, so those are the, the biggest highlights that are impacting the, the levy, the 160,000 levy request. And then we had some minor, smaller, you know, adjustments up and down that netted that 13,000, but. So, no. Could you go back to uh, what you looked at? Uh, I apologize. Um, go back just a little bit and explain what you uh, you got out of. You said merit. Or? Yeah. So the Minnesota merit system used to be our our um, process for hiring folks. So it's a state run Minnesota merit. And so whenever we would have an opening, we had to work through merit system. Applicants applied through merit system. They would get you know. Um, but we're a large enough county, we have all of the infrastructure needed in our human resource department to, to manage that. So they did certify us as our own um, entity starting January of 2023. So then I could take those yeah. costs out. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Chair. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rhonda, the net revenue changes you're showing that um, the 186,491. Um, that's that's actually you're actually anticipating increased revenue. Yes. Okay, and so that when I look at this sheet, that's what you're showing for 2024. 
uh, compared to the 335 in 2022. You're anticipating, uh, I'm assuming, the 154 in 2023 by the year end. Is that according to this document, or is that where we are now? Um, yeah, so what I was trying to show on this document, the 2022 revenues over expenditures. So you might look at that and say, well, in 2022, we had $335,000 more in revenue than we budgeted for that year yeah. so what i was trying to show is that um, with that knowledge each year we've increased in the budget our anticipated revenues based on that history so 2023 the 154 296 represents when i did the budget for 2023 you included that i include increased okay. the revenues by that amount and again in 2024 increased it by the 186 so um, what I wanted to show is that we're paying attention to. <laughs> okay, I just, to, I, yep. I, want, I, I see how the numbers yeah. jive here, but I just yep. want to make sure that I, I am yep. following, yep. that it's and, not over and above the 335. Yep. And likewise, you know, with the, the purchase services, you might say, well, gee, if you spent 473,557 less in purchase services, why aren't you reducing those purchase services going forward? And we did that. We reduced them by 228, 266 in 2023, and an additional 114, 500 in 2024. So um, that's what I'm trying to. Okay, I follow that. Now. Yeah. Thank you. So that concludes my summary questions. Um, I, so I was handed a packet that's going to be a later presentation on our overall uh, budget here, and I, I, I couldn't help but look forward to a certain page on, okay. uh, and that is what ultimately is our, is our levy request. And, and I see on here, uh, for the board, the packet that was handed out, it's, it's uh, does Rhonda have that? Uh, I don't know that Rhonda has no, it. No, I don't. Okay. But, but the, numbers, the numbers do match up with what she's talking about here, but I just want to just bring this up. So on, on the proposed levy document that Steve will go over and Lori will go over in a little bit, the total social, social services proposed budget for 2024 is the 13644810 which is what you have on page 18 of 50 of your report this this yellow sheet this deal here um, but so so just for clarity that 13 644 810 does include close to half a million dollars for that detox issue correct that's that you do have here yes that doesn't have any additional revenues associated to it correct okay so just mm -hmm. want to make sure that we're all going to be on the same page there. Yep. Um, well, good. That's that. Well, good. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gave us a good uh, documentation for your all right. stuff, and thank you very much for that. I think, do I have the next one then? Do you do. Okay, say it? okay. If Michelle's not here, I guess you're going to take care of that. Yeah, yes, I will take care of that for us. So we had a resignation in our... Um, in our child protection child welfare unit uh, case aid position um, that position has primarily been responsible for transportation to supervise visits um, for kids in foster care um, uh, working with us on court records for child protection court proceedings social medical histories um, helping us to secure birth certificates social security cards um, data entry e-filing um, in some administrative tasks. Um, that position um, is pretty critical to the work of that unit and it is in the budget and we are asking for that position to be refilled. The resigning employee was on step five. We do anticipate likely hiring somebody at a, at a lower step so we would see some budget savings but would ask the board to approve filling that position with um, back um, replacing any backfill if there would be internal interest. So moved. Second. Here we got a motion and a second to replace the position, or fill the position, excuse me. Um, any further discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. I'm gonna sneak out. Okay, let's take a short break here for about five minutes. Heck, I'm getting closer here again. A little bit closer. Uh, Joe, will you get your budget presentation for facilities department? Yep. Um, yes, good morning, Mr. Chair and board members. So I have my budget today. I'm going to be touching on, I, I, I'm not going to go line by line or anything, but I'm going to touch on the highlights of of these so you have the sheet so if you feel free to ask if you see any um, lines that you have questions about um, today we're talking about two different budgets um, one is the courthouse I, I've called it the courthouse budget over the years but it's it's kind of a m mixture of the courthouse and the LEC and the DMV and some ground so um, and then we have the Family Service Center budget to discuss as well so and then I like to take a, just a few minutes to talk at the end about um, the fund 19 building improvement you don't have any documentation on that it's uh, uh, something that I'd, I'll talk to you about though so um, so to start off with the courthouse budget um, this the buildings that are covered under this are the courthouse the LEC the jail the DMV the, and the grounds and and the storage building so the revenues that we get um, for these um, would be uh, the Resource Recovery Center reimburses this budget because what I do is I budget um, their salary for their variable hour custodian. So every year they give they do a one time of sixteen thousand oh forty seven um, to my budget to so it's essentially an in and out. And then what's new this year with the revenue on this one is we are uh, accounting for the new detox facility and um, in within this budget there's a detox category you'll see down at the bottom of, of this um, budget sheet and um, we have a proposed uh, of 164,283 and then um, Kathy McKay's budget will reimburse me at the end of the year for that as well and what's in that is um, I'm asking for a new uh, custodian full-time for the detox facility and then it covers things like um, um, the supplies custodial supplies building repair that kind of stuff so um, it's it's all those are all kind of lumped together as one too. So those are the two revenues that um, come in on the corridors or on the on this budget. So some of the expenses that that we've uh, adjusted this year are um, the gas. We've adjusted that from twenty five thousand to forty. Uh, seems like every gas we've been fighting, every building has been increasing. Um, we're also looking at increasing the other professional services line a little bit, and then the snow. Um, line as well from 50 to 60,000 so um, and then I'm asking for equipment over 500 in this budget I'm asking for ten thousand um, dollars what what we're wanting to spend that on is a, a heavy-duty trailer for the maintenance department so we are finding that we need to move around our equipment outside of the campus and we don't have any trailers and so this is something that um, we're uh, requesting as well so that's what that ten thousand dollar add is to that equipment to over 500 line in that budget so uh, we've also looked at increasing our internal services line as well um, we've uh, earlier in the year or a few weeks ago actually we, we the board approved a um, department issued vehicle for myself and then um, so that is some of the increase and then also um, we are requesting we have an Explorer right now we're requesting to take that Explorer to a truck it was used as a runner on but we're finding we're, a truck would be much more useful so so those two ads are what has uh, been the increase in my internal services um, we were budgeting 11,716 and we're taking that to uh, 20,000 um, and then just a note on the expense side too the detox expenses are 164,283 so that's that's showing down in in my expense side but uh, Kathy will reimburse me at the end of the year for that so so those are everything for the courthouse budget um, questions for me on on that budget okay family service center budget um, a few highlights here um, this this covers the family service center operations and also the mail central services department so both of those are covered within the family service center budget 
Um, revenue is on this. We uh, uh, rent this year. We have an anticipated uh, revenue of one million two hundred forty-nine thousand five hundred seven. Um, we haven't changed anything or upped anything. Uh, we're currently, we're at thirteen seventy-five per square foot, um, and twelve seventy-five. Well, that's on the first floor. Twelve seventy-five a square foot for the second through the fifth floor, and we are one hundred percent occupied right now. Um, right now, that split is a roughly a sixty-forty split where. 60% of this is budgeted through the county um, county departments will uh, pay this budget for rent and then 40% is a, a non county tenants. So um, the other revenue that we get here is uh, uh, we're expecting is from the juvenile center. It's kind of a combo of the juvenile center. Uh, we bill them for um, uh, use of gas uh, th things that share the power plant, the chiller bill, uh, boiler, gas, natural gas. That's all kind of compiled, and then we um, bill a portion of our maintenance um, salaries to them as well. And then um, at the end of the year, they, they make a one-time transfer as well. And then we are also uh, uh, get a reimbursement from the jail as well. We bill them for uh, natural gas used out of the boiler plant, So because that, that power plant kind of serves, serves these buildings. So we have a, a square footage calculation that we use for that. So. So we have an anticipated revenue of 307,658 total for that as well. So, so that's, that's the, the two main revenues that come in for the Family Service Center budget. Um, really to highlight the expenses, the, the big thing is the electricity actually went down $50,000, which, which was a good thing uh, right around the time we replaced all the LED lights is when we seen that. So that was the cause of that. Um, but then the gas, we have increased to 60,000. So between the gas, and the electricity, we still have an increase of 10,000 um, projected for this year for both of those. So, um, other than that, the, the total budget, it, it's showing that we have a, showing that we have a, a loss of 462,828, but um, Lori's the expert on this, but when you factor in depreciation, it makes it look way worse. So um, we're, uh, the budget itself is actually doing doing well in actual cash. So that is the Family Service Center. Questions for me on that? Okay, so Fund 19, just to explain that a little bit, it is a a fund that every year you put $100,000 into, and what we've done is we've, we've uh, We've used that for um, emergencies, unanticipated things that happen. We try to keep that balance at 100,000, so it's always there in case something happens. And then anything above and beyond, we've always uh, used that funds for certain things when we vet through the, the building committee about uh, projects we want to do that are that thirty, forty thousand dollar projects, sometimes fifteen, twenty. So um, we are developing a plan. We did a capital improvement plan this year. And we're all done with the bond that we took out. And what we're planning to do is, it, I'm planning to work with the building committee to do reestablish a one to three year, a five to one to three year, a three to five, and a five to ten again that we are looking at. And I'd like to put some money every year into certain facilities around the county, uh, particularly the highway. Some a couple of the highway areas that I'd like to look at. So what I'm uh, requesting is to add fifty thousand dollars to that, so it would be one hundred and fifty a year, and uh, we would um, have a plan and work with the building committee to um, to update the buildings as we go along. I, I think it'll be a while until we take another capital improvement bond, you know. So this would be a good uh, way to keep the play, keep the area up. So, so really, that's that's what I have for my budget. Any questions? Anything you see here? So your overall budget's going what up eleven point eight five or what what's your overall uh, I think what's your overall ten point six three. Ten point six three, okay. Yep. yep. Or wait, no, I looked at the wrong one, I'm sorry. Yeah, ten point eight two. Any questions for John? Well, I'm 
sir, Steve will digest all this information. Yeah. <laughs> and bring it down to about 5%. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Okay. Now for our budget presentation, Lori and Steve. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as uh, the commission is certainly aware, our budget process started uh, at the end of May with budget packets uh, coming from Ms. Johnson uh, to each of our departments. They had roughly three to four weeks to uh, to complete that process and, and hand them in. Uh, we've been going through uh, those, uh, each of those budgets with myself and Ms. Johnson and department heads over the last few weeks and they've subsequently been coming before you uh, as we just saw. Uh, our goal is to have all of the presentations completed to, to, uh, uh, to this board prior to the end of the month. Uh, and so we're working towards that. In addition to the budget, uh, budget <coughs> the departments, uh, this board has uh, historically chosen to provide the funds to outside agencies, other outside agencies, uh, and just to, to verify that uh, those increases are included uh, in, in, that, uh, in this budget. Uh, and lastly, there are a number of, number of additional requests, uh, both internally and externally, that we'll talk about uh, through this process. Um, state statute requires uh, that uh, the Department of Revenue provide certified county program aid uh, to us by uh, to counties by August 1st. Uh, we did receive that information uh, at the, uh, by that time. Uh, historically, this board has utilized those funds uh, for uh, across the board uh, property tax release for our citizens. Uh, as you guys are aware, uh, this past year, the 2023 legislature uh, increased uh, county program aid appropriations by. Uh, $80 million uh, for, for all of our counties. Uh, we'll also be looking at a, a, an increase uh, next year. Uh, that won't be quite to that, that degree, uh, but an increase next year. Having said that, this year's uh, funding increase uh, based on the, uh, the qualifying requirements had an increase to Clay County of roughly 1.4 million more than what we had anticipated. Uh, and so uh, that brought the total of five million five hundred thirty-six thousand six hundred fifty-one dollars. We'll go into a little bit more detail uh, uh, about that this morning. Within your packet, uh, you have uh, you have five uh, different documents. We're going to touch on them uh, in various uh, various ways. Again, the sales tax summary uh, is just an oversight that we like to provide three or four uh, times to this commission, uh, uh, just as as an update. We're also going to talk about fund balance comparison document. We talked about that in greater detail uh, back in May, uh, but just wanted to keep that in the forefront as you guys make decisions. Uh, as in the past years, you have looked to utilize fund balance uh, to offset the levy. Uh, we also have the summary of revenues and, and expenses by departments, uh, just to kind of show uh, where we are year to date, and that is gonna be through July. Um, uh, and then also we have the, we'll have the summary of the of the 24, 2024 tax levy by funds, which Mr. Campbell has highlighted uh, already. Uh, and we've also have a, a document that shows uh, shows the new requests that you've heard, but it brings them them all together. Uh, again, at the end of this, we'll be looking uh, for your feedback and also your direction. And so, uh, with that, uh, if there's not, aren't any questions, I'll move into the first sales tax summary document. I think just the only clarification is that we had a request from the HRA that is not necessarily identified in the external requests because of the way that they collect the funds, but just to remember that was also a sizable request. That is, that is correct. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, our sales tax, uh, as, uh, as the board is uh, certainly aware, uh, back in 2015-16, uh, when we were in the process of constructing the, the jail and law enforcement center, uh, the board went uh, to the legislature for permission for a half cent sales tax. Uh, uh, during that process, we were looking to collect anywhere from about a 1.6 million to 2.2 million uh, in a stepped up, uh, step, uh, top, step version. Uh, to cover a portion of the payment of the law enforcement center and correctional facility. We also had a, about roughly $400,000 that, uh, that came from our levy uh, to pay the principal and, in principal and interest. Uh, 
Uh, as, the, as this process has started, we've seen increases uh, to the Hefson sales tax on an annual basis and starting in 2021, uh, we, we, were, we had received enough Hefson sales tax to pay the full principal and interest. And so we, we've removed uh, that uh, building portion from the levy. Uh, but it's one of the things that uh, from that standpoint, we've continually review this. Uh, and so the board is uh, on top of knowing uh, if we'll need to uh, go back at any point. Uh, to this point, if you take a look at the 2023 uh, 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 column there on the far right, uh, we're continued to seeing strong, um, strong uh, half cent sales tax uh, receipts. Uh, we did see uh, a number of months this year uh, that we did see a, a slight decrease from the previous year. Uh, having said that, uh, I think in our discussions of where uh, the the 20 the August payment is just a portion of that payment, right? We'll have a one smaller piece uh, and uh, are anticipating uh, that we'll continue to, to be able to meet the full principal and interest pay. Yeah, uh, we've continually been increasing uh, year over year and we did have, have a couple of months of down uh, a decreased amount this year, but now we're back up so it looks like we're on an increase again. So we'll, I would say we'll be between a seven and 8% increase for the full year at least. Does all that money go to the jail uh, yes. or LEZ? Uh, any questions? Um, any questions at all on, on this document? All right. Again, like I say, oh, go ahead. They're on that. So um, just be new. So that will just shorten the length of the repayment of the bond, right? That's possible. If, if it keeps increasing like this, then we'll be able to pay off the bonds possibly earlier but there's no guarantee to that yeah just have to wait and see how that goes but we're on potentially on track to do so yeah. okay and and commissioner Krabinoff, uh, just a, a reminder too that these funds can only be used towards towards that we can't right. attempt any portion yep. of any other budgets thank you <clears throat> all right now we'll continue to keep uh, the board up to date with uh, any changes there uh, fund balance comparison again as i mentioned i don't not really intend to spend a whole lot of time uh, here as we spent a lot of time talking about it uh, in May. But just a reminder, our, our general fund, we actually anticipated running out of deficit uh, in, in 2022 uh, from the standpoint of utilizing fund balance. Uh, we also had uh, uh, some business relief that showed up uh, in 2022 that was, per, that was paid out uh, in 2021. And then I think we also had a, some uh, small county adjustments that impacted uh, the general fund. Roan Bridge, again, is kind of a, a uh, is based on the projects uh, that, uh, that are part of the five-year plan. And so it's in and out. It's also impacted on depending on, as, as Rhonda talked about earlier in her budget, when some of those payments are, or the final payments are made can also impact that. Social services, uh, we heard in great detail this morning. I won't touch on that. Uh, the building fund, again, is the $50,000 uh, of the other fund that you provide, Joe, to do some work uh, maintaining the campus and the buildings. Uh, and that's uh, roughly $50,000 each year. Uh, the internal service, uh, again, we, have, uh, we saw an increase uh, in that category. Uh, many of our departments uh, put away funds uh, so we don't get in situations where we're having a one-time payment. Uh, we save over the lifetime of that vehicle, and so when it's time to, uh, to purchase that uh, item, uh, we don't see a spike. Uh, public health uh, also saw an increase last year. I think both as in social services, that was a combination of, of lower expenses due to staffing and an increase in proposed, uh, proposed revenue. Uh, the solid waste uh, the department there, again, we saw an influx of money uh, as part of the, uh, the resource recovery project uh, and so facility, and so we saw the increase there. Family Service Center maintained uh, about the same, and the Juvenile Detention Center saw a small decrease, but uh, as uh, you may recall, the Juvenile Center looks at, has a two-year look back and utilizes some of its revenue to pay down, uh, pay down uh, the cost per bed for our, our member, member um, counties. And so um, that's just a, a brief overview. If there are any questions there. 
If not, we'll just move into the summary of revenue and expenditures by department. Uh, again, as we've talked in the past, generally our revenues run anywhere from two to three months behind. So the main focus that we have generally during these updates uh, is uh, is in the expense area. Uh, we're at 53, or excuse me, 58 percent of the year. Uh, and as we've reviewed uh, the expenses uh, uh, on your right-hand columns there, we did not find any, any uh, department that was out of line. You're, you are going to see uh, some 100%, 90%, uh, and generally what you're gonna see in those situations are, uh, have to do with the, the agencies that we provide funding one time quarterly, uh, twice a year, uh, and so they're, they're gonna indicate uh, those, those payments in that way. Otherwise, uh, the, uh, the, the expenditures appear to be in, uh, in good, uh, good shape. Uh, there is, again, uh, emergency management. We, we talked about that with the Sheriff's Department. There is a 911% uh, uh, increase in expenses, and again, that has to do with um, uh, some of the, the CARES, but also some of the, fund, uh, the funds that we utilize through FEMA to, uh, to address different things uh, with the flood. Are there any questions, uh, expenditures for the year? Overall, uh, we appear to be in, in a very solid position. All right, uh, the, the information that you're all probably most interested to hear is our summary of uh, 2024 tax levy by funds. Uh, again, uh, based on uh, this document, we'll just provide a little bit of insight here. General fund revenues uh, are $28,603,600, uh, excuse me, $603,644. Uh, again, uh, the, the biggest demand of increase here uh, would be uh, your steps, uh, uh, your insurance, 8% uh, insurance increase. Uh, and you're also, one of the things that we've talked a little bit about is this year we did input the 3% COLA that we have contracted with other bargaining units uh, within, uh, within the budget. And so normally we show that under the new request area. Uh, and so this would be included in, in that area. Uh, and so you do, do see an increase of about $2.2 million uh, from 2023. Uh, the road and bridge fund, uh, uh, just a slight increase, again, that has to do uh, with the, the projects that will be completing or proposed to be completed in 2024. The building fund is at $50,000 that we talked about that Joe utilizes um, for pr different projects uh, throughout, the, throughout our county uh, for the buildings. Uh, again, previously, this is where the, the additional dollars for uh, the, from the levy for the jail would have, would have shown in, in previous budgets. The library, uh, we're, we're mandated to provide by statute to provide service uh, funding for our local libraries. Uh, the request this year uh, is $326,320. Uh, and then lastly, the social service fund, which we just heard about, uh, that request uh, is $13,644,810. Uh, $13, and again, I think just a, a note that uh, as the detox facility uh, does come to fruition, uh, uh, Ms. Johnson and I have had a conversation of breaking that out completely um, from, uh, from social services, not that there, wouldn't, there would still need to be a, a funding mechanism, whether that was from social services or from the general fund. Uh, but uh, as uh, that facility grows, I think there's a great deal that makes sense about uh, making that its standalone budget. Uh, when we, we bring that the total uh, tax levy uh, from those items, uh, it's uh, $48,616. Uh, uh, it's a 7.5% increase uh, over uh, last year. Uh, we have new requests, and, and I think rather than uh, I'll kind of jump back between, you have uh, the two sheets uh, that kind of lay out, uh, lay out those two new requests. Uh, I'll probably just try to highlight uh, as a reminder uh, uh, on each of these requests, if I can. Um, uh, the first one is technology services, uh, $85,000 and $25,000, if you recall. The $85,000 is actually a, uh, a professional service agreement of, for uh, security uh, that, that Rory, uh, Rory Schmitz has come and talked to this board about. Uh, and then equipment, internal service. Again, uh, Rory is continuing to make sure that we have the uh, proper funding to replace laptops, computers, printers, 
and, and, and has chosen to do that more on an incremental basis uh, versus one-time asks. So that's $110,000. Uh, Mr. Melton came here, I believe, last week uh, in requesting uh, both a county attorney and a victim witness advocate based on the increased uh, caseload that they're seeing uh, within his department. Uh, those expenses are 102250 for the attorney uh, and $86,954 for the victim witness advocate. Um, Joe's, uh, Joe's trailer that he talked about uh, for $10,000 is the next item. Uh, the Sheriff's Department uh, has, has requested um, uh, two additional deputies with squad cars and equipment fit up. Uh, that was $499,556. Um, the, oh, that also, excuse me, that also includes um, uh, a com community service officer uh, to help offset uh, some of the, the running uh, that, that currently is uh, sergeant or lieutenants and, and administration are taking care of. And it also includes a, a ranger um, uh, to better deal with uh, snow, snow events. Uh, juvenile Detention Prisoner Board. For some reason, that's not ringing a bell for me. I, we haven't been through his budget yet, okay. so. Um, so I, I think they're, the, I don't know that, it, basically they have a contract just like they do at the jail, and I'm anticipating that that showed up as an increase because each year there's an automatic trigger. So we probably really, really didn't need to have that there, but that's most likely what that's from. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, this past year, uh, the, the commission, the request from the chamber last year was for $100,000. Uh, that is the same request this year. Last year, uh, it was $150,000 went into our levy, and $50,000 <laughs> specifically for the Ignite program came from, uh, came from our ARPA committee. The ARPA committee uh, has met this year and has determined that, uh, that they wouldn't be in support of uh, providing that $50,000 for the Ignite program, not necessarily because they don't think it's doing good work, but that um, I guess the, the question from a commitment standpoint if there are better ways to utilize those funds. Uh, and so, so that did, uh, that 50,000 did fall into the levy. Uh, a, a place for hope. Uh, we just heard from Rhonda and just I want the board to be uh, very clear here. Uh, there's two par portions from a place for hope. Uh, number one is the mental health component clubhouse that is that Rhonda spoke about in her budget. Uh, the request, uh, this request came to Rhonda. Uh, initially, and this has to do more uh, with the food shelf. And, and we've had their executive director here uh, multiple times. Uh, as a board, you've cho chosen to provide ARPA funds uh, and maybe CARES dollars even uh, through, that, through that process. Uh, and, uh, and here's an increase uh, or a request of appropriation, uh, again, that this would specifically, um, specifically deal with um, with the food service or the food shelf portion of it. Uh, Rhonda, just to, uh, Rhonda's not here, but just in our conversations, it's not that Rhonda doesn't support uh, that, that uh, request per se, but uh, her concern is uh, a lot of their state mandated, uh, I guess, resources that they need. Uh, felt that uh, she had other needs that uh, rather than support this. And so that's why it's uh, here before the board for consideration. And then also um, the senior coordination program. Uh, we have a, a senior transportation program uh, here in Clay County. Uh, over the last uh, two years, uh, the ARPA committee has chosen to provide some funding uh, to, to uh, <coughs> per, for allow that service to continue to work. Uh, they have continued to try to find ongoing, uh, ongoing permanent, uh, permanent funding uh, through different grants, uh, but have been unsuccessful uh, and have made the request of $54,075 uh, for next year. Um, this, this also has been vetted through, uh, through the uh, ARPA committee. The ARPA committee chose not to uh, fund uh, that. Uh, I think we've had some discussions at the board level uh, about uh, some of the concerns where the number of uh, rides per cost uh, was fairly expensive uh, and also the concern with the fact that uh, they have been unable or un unsuccessful in getting grant dollars and so from a sustainability uh, position there's been some concern there. Uh, the second page uh, we have a road and bridge. Uh, Steve, uh, oh, just, sorry. just yeah. real quick. So I, I'm a little confused here because it, right under a place for hope 
It has appropriations for Chamber of Commerce. What? I just made a mistake. When I just oh. copied lines down and I okay. forgot to change. Okay, so, so the same would apply going. under the other. But not the bottom, yeah. Senior one. That, same that's, thing. Okay, I, I just, yep. I was just a little confused on that. Okay. Uh, the, the next item is highway maintenance. Uh, as uh, you may recall, the last week I believe Justin came forward and he has a new request for uh, a maintenance person. Uh, again, they have uh, the vehicles for that with time off, uh, uh, FMLA situations. Uh, Justin was often finding that his supervisor was being placed in a, in a blade, uh, moving, uh, doing different things, especially during snow events, uh, which isn't always the best. Uh, part of that was brought upon the, the fact that we do have multiple part-time salaries and with the job market the way that it is, Justin's been struggling to be able to find uh, those people to take on a part-time position uh, uh, to help us out. And so uh, there would be a, a, net, a net increase of $72,003 uh, for that uh, with, with the regular salary minus uh, the part-time piece. Uh, and then the last one was is social services. Uh, again, we had we had a brief discussion on that, and Rhonda will be coming forward uh, with that. It sounds like in a couple of weeks to to talk in more detail to give you insight on that. Uh, but those two requests minus the revenues that would be brought in uh, would be one hundred twenty eight thousand nine hundred and five dollars for a for a total of one million one hundred seventy three thousand seven hundred seventy five dollars. Of these new requests, uh, 1,012,895 are county requests, uh, and non-county requests are 160,880. Uh, now, I would note, uh, in addition to this, uh, with for those um, previous um, uh, agencies that you guys have, have supported in the past, they also will have very increases uh, of um, also, but that's not captured. And here, that'll be captured in the, in the full budget. Um, but these are your brand new requests uh, for, for uh, your consideration for, for 2024. Are there any questions? Mr. Chair. Thank you. Just a point of clarification. In the summary of revenues and expenditures by department, at the very bottom, we have our external agencies and the senior coordinator coordination program for lakes and prairies is listed there. and, and um, People that maybe have been around a little while, I think that is fair to say that was the position held by Dale Raleigh, correct? I, that's that piece. And then on the new requests, you have the senior coordination program piece at the bottom. I think you clarified that by talking about that being the rural transportation piece. But just for those of us here, it might be confusing. If we're talking about one, it's not necessarily talking about the one that ex exists in the budget uh, currently. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, that the one position is covered through uh, through Rhonda's budget, and she continues to support okay. that. Okay, and so um, you know, I, I certainly, being the rural commissioner, hear often about how handy it is to have an opportunity to have some rural transportation. I go back to my maybe 4-H years, and when you talk about your cost per wear. I think that is that's really where we struggle. Uh, what that request for lakes and prairies would be, um, you know, I think the utilization rate is much much lower than we'd hoped. I think it's it's growing, but still, you know, if if we were to entertain um, maybe not funding that new request, I certainly feel like there's something we could work out to get the same service, um, maybe not in the same form, but um, for a substantially cheaper, um, cheaper amount, and and I know in the past there's been rural transit um, dollars that the the county board is is supported, and and so I I really hope that whatever we decide, we can work towards some sort of direction for um, folks in rural Clay County that there's an option. But again. Um, I, I'm not leaning towards personally supporting the $54,000 request on that just because I know how expensive it is per ride. I can get you the, the ridership usages um, if you need. So um, that's where I'm, I'm there. And then um, and to that, I, I'm, I am also struggling about the amount requested for the Place for Hope uh, food shelf component. And, and because I've 
been really active with um, the Cass Clay Food Partnership before Commissioner uh, Krabinoff took took my position there on there that what I, I struggle with I hear the need and I know there's a need and I understand that but I also represent rural Clay County food shelves that don't necessarily include that component and so what I worry about is is picking one over the other just because one might have a, a more visible louder voice uh, at the table and so I think it would disproportionately um, affect those other food shelves in the county so I, I do struggle with that one that doesn't um, negate the need that's re included in Rhonda's budget I really feel like that is an important service that that I, are we taking them as two separate requests? Yes. Yeah, so so the, the Place for Hope mental health component that's listed in Rhonda's budget right. is something that she continues to support. Right. And I'm not, that's, I'm not talking to that. That's a need there. But I do struggle with, with the um, $50,000 request. For I'm sorry to ask a question back to that. Back to that. The uh, Place for Hope, that was at 65 in her budget, correct? I mean, that's the memory, or... Look, yeah, I believe it was right around that. that so this is beyond this that is, specific this is a, yeah. for the shell. Yeah, so so the, the Place for Hope has two components. They have a, a, a what they call a clubhouse, which deals with the mental health component. And then they, during COVID, they, they grew and expanded a, a food shelf. Right. And so the food shelf portion is what is the new request. Um, and so... Rhonda continues to support, and it has that within her budget, the mental health component. It's yeah. one of those things that are regulated and required by the state. Uh, yeah, and I realized it too, but I thought in that 65, there was a, a bit for both, but maybe not. That's no. It's she, all for the mental health yes, side. Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I, you know, I, I appreciate the comments that were just made, the real trends. I, I think that the numbers that we were showing, you know, based on, on total rides versus the dollar spent I think we were we were upwards of well over a hundred dollars per ride and in cost so I I agree with the comments made by Commissioner Mojo but it doesn't doesn't mean that there shouldn't be some other uh, way to approach the needs uh, for ridership in rural Clay County uh, I'm not I'm not quite prepared today to go over each of these I'm I'm just kind of taking in all the new requests and I'm certainly going to have some other uh, opinions similar I, my first opinion right off the gate is is I have an opinion on why a cost of government is going up four million five hundred and forty one thousand dollars in one year that's that's a little bit bigger question for me that that's gonna take some but we'll have those discussions before the preliminary budget uh, but I, I Laurie I wanted to ask you one question and, and maybe can you point out in here uh, one of the things that we've been working on through our insurance committee was that uh, need to start establishing that fund. I think last year we put in 200 and this year's 250. Can you tell me where that is on here? That's in the unallocated area. Okay. Towards, so Towards the bottom there. So there's the 1,079,560. It's 200 in, 200 in there. Okay. So, so as we um, move further into this in that unallocated area, can we get a breakdown of what, what else is in there? Sure. Yeah. So that just so we have, you know, you know, I'm Paul's kind of new on on this too, and I think it would just be helpful to know what all those types of things are, all grouped together in in that category. Yeah, it's mostly so we'd have the 200 for that plus billing insurance, workers' comp insurance, okay, and then some transfer out. Type okay. Of things. Okay. Uh, so just to kind of continue on there with the with the 1.1 uh, $1 million dollar. Uh, discussion that we just had that that would bring the total levy uh, to forty nine forty nine million one hundred and seventy four thousand three hundred ninety two dollars or a ten point eight percent increase uh, as I mentioned uh, that, that we also do receive county program aid again this Commission has utilized that as uh, as property tax relief in the in the past uh, and that would be five million five hundred and thirty six thousand six hundred and fifty one dollars uh, which would take uh, that spread levy down to forty three million six hundred and thirty seven thousand seven hundred and fourteen dollars or a seven point six four percent increase uh, we have new construction uh, uh, again anticipated of one point two percent which would take uh, the net levy increase at six point four four percent today uh, 
if you were to accept this uh, this budget as of today. Uh, just from a historical standpoint, generally the first time we come to you, uh, we are we are in that anywhere from 10 to 13 percent range, uh, and so. Uh, uh, we know that that, uh, that and most likely this number isn't going to be acceptable. And so we are looking for uh, some, some direction uh, as we move forward. As the new guy, I, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> uh, I, if I may. Okay. So new requests. I mean, there's just a couple things in my head and, I, and will they be add? So back to what uh, Commissioner Mojo asked about HRA. I don't see any of that in here, correct? That's and then correct. the other one, again, just sort of uh, part of being with Commissioner Ebinger over with the uh, EDC, you know, I don't, is there a, am I missing something if they have a request on it for that? So the, the, uh, the EDC, uh, the, the existing payment that we've provided for uh, the EDC and the request for next year is 111,000. Excuse me, yeah, 110,000 uh, dollars, and that is included within within this budget. Okay, so. thank you. So it's really the HRA one that's really not any part of this discussion yet. That's correct. And and that is that is levied with its separate levy. It's similar to how the watershed levies, and so it doesn't show up within something. It doesn't show up within our levy budget or our budget documents because they're a separate levy such as the watershed but when it, but it, it, Lori, in, in terms of when a when a property owner receives that property tax statement and they you know they do the calculation you still have that so for example that 500,000 that that the HRA has requested that really would still be about a one and a half percent increase. Uh, yeah, so uh, it, would, it would show in the bottom line increase, a, but it would show along with the watershed. Right. It doesn't show as part of the county. It is included in the but it other is, levies. It's, it's, but it, but it, is, it is still an additional amount that everybody would pay. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Thank you. The increases that we get in on property tax, everybody, as everybody said, their property tax went up last year. I mean, I, I see new construction shows 1.20 percent. How does that other property tax? How does that figure in in this budget? Where do, I mean, we're getting extra money from all the extra property tax. No, we're not getting extra. How it works is you set the levy, and that gets spread across all of the value. And so, whether it's new construction or increased value, it just gets spread across that value. So we don't get any more. We only get what we're asking for. The new so, construction. The new construction helps spread what we're spending over a greater amount of property. Correct. Is really what that is. If I may add, uh, explain the valuation piece then. So I totally understand that. So we had these increases in valuations at our, you know, our hearings and all that. That number, that that increased number, is the number we use the levy against, correct? Correct. But we, so say the say the valuation was ten million, mm -hmm. and we levied this amount, it would get we would get we would get this forty three million. Mm -hmm. Say the valuation was a hundred million. And we spread this 43 million. We still would only get 43 million because right. it gets spread across all the value. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. The value the value doesn't represent an increased property tax all by itself. Right. If everybody's value went up and our levy stayed the same, everybody's taxes would stay the same. Unless there was a shift. Uh, unless there's a shift. I mean, there's lots of other complications to that. But I can guarantee you with what's proposed here with uh, $4,541,000, everybody's taxes will go up. <laughs> I appreciate that clarification. <laughs> that helps. Okay. Any further on the budget? We have uh, we have nothing more to present, uh, Mr. Chair. But again, I think in, in past history, uh, uh, this board has is, is, uh, kind of given us 
uh, knowing that 6.44 from what I hear is not acceptable, uh, you've kind of given us a target to go back, sharpen our pencil, uh, and, and to try to come back with a, a more appealing uh, increase uh, both to for you and to for our citizens. Right, and I guess that's where my side comments on some of the new requests were. So I apologize if you didn't want them right yet. Oh. But um, understanding, I also uh, agree. Six point four four is really hard to stomach. I I really really struggle with the new construction percentage, and and it's not really growing at the rate at which it's going down. And I understand new construction is new construction, but um, you know sometimes those can go hand in hand. Um, understanding that there is a committee now that will work at some of the public safety funding to maybe offset some of the requests that the sheriff's department has. Um, it will be interesting to see that, but you guys always do a great job of working your magic on these budget numbers. So thank you for the work that's gone into it. See, were there um, any new revenues that came in that really were somewhat surprising through legislature that is you know, helped us in, 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 in ways that are kind of sustainable, you know? Well, I think the county program aid is probably your most significant. Okay. Uh, we, you know, we received a lot of one-time uh, one -time payments uh, over the, this last legislative session, but the county program aid is certainly the, the, the biggest impact. Uh, I believe that we're, we're also looking at, uh, it does, it's not gonna be $80 million again next year, but they've, uh, we'll see a, a more of an increase than what we had anticipated going into 2025. And it's, correct. So in which you're saying is still a, a significant increase, probably over 23. Yeah. So uh, just to kind of well, you you can see here from the 2023 levy, uh, we were we were at four million ninety three thousand two hundred six. We were anticipating initially about another hundred to hundred twenty five thousand. Uh, there and so uh, the impacts of the legislature are pretty significant. Uh, otherwise, that 6.4 would look a lot different. Are our reserves pretty much where we want them to be? Do we want to add to that or? Our what, Mr. Chair? Reser reserves are. The reserves. Um, I think you know we we talk about that quite often. Uh, you know we're in a fairly good position. Uh, from a reserve standpoint, as we mentioned, I think probably the last seven years, uh, the board has looked to utilize uh, some reserves. Uh, part of part of the, where I guess we feel good uh, this year from the standpoint is we continue to see uh, gaps in employment. Uh, and so as Rhonda shared just with her one budget, while she's uh, the biggest budget, uh, biggest staffing, there are some savings, uh, savings that happen um, throughout the year. Uh, that we need to we need to anticipate those positions, uh, but because of the gaps, we see some savings. So that was going to be um, one of the questions, and I and I really appreciate what Rhonda had pro showed us that you know that for various reasons in 2022 there was 292,000, almost 293,000 in in unspent wage numbers compared to what we levied for. And that, you know, that goes into reserves as opposed to, you know, it, should you have should you have budgeted that much to begin with? Could be a question you could be asking, because we know, you know, and, and that was going to be one of the things that I was going to ask. And I hate to ask too much of Lori when she's busy, but but is is there a way over, say, the last three to five years, you could combine? all of what we levied for wages in each in each budget cycle versus what we spent in each but just the total dollar amounts even just to give us an idea of what kind of percentage you know you, you follow what i'm saying yep yeah that shouldn't i mean whether i do it for one year or if i do it for well but i years, I, I think a historic amount of time, I, so but it's, I, it's yeah but i think a historical pers yeah. perspective is good so if you could go back three to five years to do that. I think that's helpful yeah. because that might tell us, well, okay, now we're budgeting. You know, what we've talked about in the past that wages represent about 80% of our budget. Right. And, if, and if we're over budgeting, you know, on 80% of our budget, what what historically has that been? Yeah, no, I could definitely I can I, definitely do that. I, we, we do kind of account for that a little bit by utilizing fund balance. We used, 
utilize right. a million in the general fund and 350, I believe, in social services. Right. We do kind of account for that a little bit, but I can but, I can definitely do that for but, you. But when but when we go back and make the decision to use some fund balances, which I in those instances I look at those as just being overcharged our taxpayers <laughs> compared to what we. That's the way I look at that. Uh, how do you know? How do we? The next year you adjust for that. Uh, it, I don't know that if, if we budget $1 million in, in salaries and we only spend 800000 I don't think it was the intent of the board when we budgeted that $1 million for that extra 200000 that wasn't spent just to go into reserves. I don't, you know, if, if, we, if we want to budget for reserves, let's budget for reserves. And uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Campbell, I don't think that we're necessarily, we're not budgeting for reserves. I think that, you know, social services, public health, juvenile center, law enforcement, they would prefer that there aren't gaps uh, in, 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 in you know, where that funds are coming from. And, and I don't think it changes from the fact that those positions are still needed. Right. Um, it, it just is certainly a, a an opportunity for the commission to consider uh, consider utilizing some of those what becomes fund balance uh, to offset future future budgets yeah and I, and and again that's what I want I, I want to make sure that this board knows and everybody knows that just because there were excess dollars from the previous year that doesn't mean they're not we can't use those that's what that's what I'm the point I'm trying to make here is that you know every, we seem to get pretty protective of reserves, um, you know, and rightfully so to a certain degree. And then one last, so I'm not misunderstanding it. Uh, can we go back and on the placeholder for the detox center that we talked about, 445,000, how will that be utilized? That's the part I wasn't. So, so the, we, ha we haven't, I guess, gone through that budget particularly, our, our Lori and I, but, uh, but that's going to be for the operations, right? So oh, that will yeah. be the additional, additional costs. Uh, and so in 2024, we won't see a principal interest. We may see, may see an interest charge, but we won't see a principal interest charge. That will show up uh, at a later, in a later budget, 2025. But anticipating that you're going to have additional staff for part of the year, that's what that form That's correct, I, yes. Yep, additional costs to operate the heating, cooling, um, yes, yep. But it did not incorporate the additional ability for revenues. Right. Which I think, I think be, they did some, but what, what was covered in that extra 455, is that what it was? Um, it's only for half a year, so it's starting July 1st. I don't know if they've fully vetted out what kind of revenues they'll be getting yet. So we haven't been through the public health budget yet, so. Next week. Okay. Thank you. If you're done, I mean. Yeah, and if there's no other questions. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next we got Justin. We request approval of the final Contract voucher for SAP 01460107. Yes, good morning. So the first item I have is for the approval of the final contract voucher for the CASA 1 grading project. So this project was completed last year, um, and the final amount to be approved is $1,332,344.50. I thought the project outside of the CenturyLink that you guys are well aware of did go really well once it was completed. Any How close questions was this on the, the bid project? The original bid was one million one hundred and forty three thousand nine hundred and ninety one dollars and eighty five cents. Okay. So it's about sixteen point five percent over most of that being because of the CenturyLink change order that I did bring here. Of which we are looking at for. That's correct. And the, now that we have a final amount, we can, I can work with the attorney's office and MnDOT. All right. And we'll move approval. Second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second to approve. 
proof to one million three hundred thirty-two thousand three hundred forty-four dollars and ninety cents. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So the second item I have is the deficient bridge resolution. So there is two resolutions, one for county bridges and one for township bridges. So the highway department has two bridge inspectors that are certified, one being myself, and then we are working to get a third one. So we do also do all the township bridge inspections as we're the program administrator for, for those. So each year we do whichever bridges are due on their inspection cycle, and I bring forward this resolution kind of noting which bridges we're looking to replace in the next five years. So in order to receive bridge bond funds or township bridge funds, the bridge must be on this list and subsequently also have an LPI of 60 or below, and this LPI is listed on the resolutions as well. And that's a local planning index is what that's called. And that's just a number that's generated based on a bunch of different metrics when you're doing a bridge inspection. So if it's 60 or below, that bridge is eligible for funding if funding is available. Okay. Mr. Chair, I would move resolution 2023-16 for the county bridge replacement priority list. I'll second the motion. Okay, we've got a motion and a second to be request the county bridge replacement priority list. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Mr. Chair, I'll also make a motion to approve resolution 2023-17. Second. We've got a motion and a second to Clay County Township Bridge Replacement Priority List, Resolution Number 2023-17. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then the final item I have this morning is requesting approval of a proposal for pavement testing with Braun Intertech. So this is <coughs> testing CASA 11 from Sabin to Trunk Highway 336. CASA 19 from 26 into Averill, CASA 34 east of Euland to the county line, and CASA 34 from Felton to Georgetown. So this, this testing does a lot of different things, including taking cores. It's really helpful in terms of scoping projects that are on the five-year plan and making sure that we're spending our dollars wisely. And Braun has done our pavement testing for quite, quite a few years since I've been here. That Casa 34, when is that the schedule for? for Which portion? East of Ulan? Yeah. East so, and I'm working on the five-year plan right now. It was supposed to be next year. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case. Uh, hmm. I did go to a sugar beet pre-pile meeting in Ulan the other day, and there is a pretty nasty section just east of town. So we are actually going to be patching that. Northern Improvement's going to be putting a patch over that. Okay. Because I was at a meeting last night, they were discussing that uh, yep. bump there in the road. So that'll be patched, hopefully, before Labor Day. Okay. Very good. Okay. Excuse me for interrupting there. No problem. I'll make a motion to approve the proposal for Brown <coughs> Intersect for provide the paving test in the amount of $30,970. Second. Yeah, we've got a motion and a second to approve the pavement project, taste pre, excuse me, pavement testing. Uh, Justin, is this, do you have, do you have this in one of your line items in your budget? Yes, it is. So in my 2023 budget, I increased this line item quite a bit because trying to match both what we were spending and also to account for more pavement testing. So it is a budgeted item. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We do Mr. have how we track it today, don't we? Mr. Chair, if I may. Yep. Justin, we had a report on our uh, budget uh, request summaries, and I um, see that you have a request in there, too. I'm hoping that you're, um, as it's been difficult to hire an assistant county um, engineer, I'm hoping that that's at the forefront of conversations too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that is a, a budgeted item, but making sure that we're being effective in planning for how we 
mitigate not having an assistant for you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm actually meeting with Steve and Darren here in a couple of weeks to okay. discuss that. Thanks. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. A little bit. Okay. Committee reports. Kevin, you want to start this out today? Sure, I can. Thank you, Mr. August 1st, we did have a, um, a meeting with uh, um, our architects to go over um, the timeline for the start of the um, DMV construction. We certainly were um, hoping for a sooner start to help give them a little bit more time in the fall. And um, so, so we had that discussion and it went through with uh, Klein McCarthy and then also with Birds Construction on what we could, how we could possibly do that. And then I'll get to that, uh, the, the results of that based on a later meeting in a minute. But uh, then we had our, on August 2nd, we had our insurance committee meeting. Uh, we talked about uh, several things. The, uh, the renewal rate, obviously, we're locked in at 8%. Had we not had that, had that guarantee, the number would have been in excess of 20%. Uh, so certainly that, that has really been helpful for us. We have another one more year after this with a guaranteed rate. And that is why I asked the question about why we're also putting money into reserve, because by the time this is all said and done, the numbers look like we'll probably have to have you know, even before we could consider the potential of doing self-insurance, you know, potentially a million and a half dollars in the bank to, to be able to do that. So, uh, the, there was, there was some minor changes to the, the, uh, those people that were on the 3750 plan based on IRS regulations. Uh, that number had to go from 3750 to 4000 and likewise it was a similar for that was for single and that's the same for family uh, It went to I believe 8000 or something. Yeah, I don't yeah, okay, and then uh, we had some discussion about uh, dental and there is a proposal for about a 9% increase in that based on what's coming out um, You know in perspective when we made the switch to um, Delta Dental several years ago, we went from fifty some, we went from fifty some dollars to forty one dollars, uh, and so now even with this nine percent increase, we'd be about forty five dollars, forty four dollars. Well, okay, and that so that still is considerably less than what we had we were paying before we had made <coughs> the change. So. Um, we're meeting again here in another two weeks, I think, and then there will be a formal recommendation coming forward from um, the insurance committee on that action. And we did, you know, we went into the detail about um, claims information and administration costs and all of those types of things. Uh, then we had a um, discussion about some of the non-grandfathered, there's a potential on a couple of the plans that our county contribution will not, potentially not cover the full amount of one of those, uh, or a couple of those plans. And, and so there's been conversation about um, county contribution, but uh, just want to remind everybody, but the, the county contribution portion is established in contract and it's also uh, this board's decision on, on what final county contribution is made. So uh, as we move forward, we've got to keep that, keep that in mind. Uh, on August 7th, then, we, we did meet again yesterday uh, regarding the, the DMV. And what was originally going to be a construction start date or after the bids were, if we ex the bids were accepted, con begin construction was going to be October 31st. Through this process, with um, a lot of effort by Klein McCarthy, we've been able to move that date back to where the board would approve the bids on October 10th, and construction could start on October 11th. So that I mean that three-week time period at, at that time of year is very important because our goal, of course, is to try to get as much of that groundwork done 
you know, before heavy freeze up starts as possible, and that that three weeks could be critical. And so there was really good communication between our architects, Klein McCarthy, and with Gertz, and in, in establishing the ability to do that. Um, so the bid set will be ready on September 11th. The bid posting will happen on September 12th. The bid opening, it's a, it's a deal that Gertz does, um, is, is scheduled for October 3rd when they'll actually open the bids. And then Gertz has to take that week from the 3rd to the 10th when we get it to kind of go over all of the different bids and, and select each one based on each component of the project. Uh, and then, um, then yesterday, and we did, we did get get into the design a little bit yesterday too. And there was uh, there was there was some really good discussion that uh, there was. I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but there was one wall that kind of covered uh, a a big area thing that. So when our when our cl our customers would come in and go to a window, they would it almost looked like they were in a tunnel, and so based, and it was a good thing we finally got the three D uh, review of that, and so we were able to basically remove that entire wall, which actually will be a cost savings for us, and it would allow then our employees to actually see some daylight from the windows as opposed to that wall blocked all their daylight and. It, Originally, we thought, okay, it's, it was a good idea, but when you saw it in a 3D, it, it just did not work. So, so we made those uh, suggested changes yesterday as well. And then, the, uh, then we had the detox or, uh, uh, withdrawal management uh, that afternoon, and that was basically I think we, we looked at the samples for the exterior. I think you're gonna find it very, very similar to what we have at the LEC in terms of, and, and with the new, um, uh, actually that, no, excuse me, that was the DMB. The, we looked at that and it's gonna, the DMB is gonna be very similar in ex, exterior to the withdrawal management and the LEC. So all of our buildings are gonna kind of look fairly similar. And then we did get into um, in detox. It was basically going over some changes. There was one change that was made that Commissioner Mojo and I gave pre-approval on yesterday because it's time sensitive and it deals within the ground. And that's a change order for underfloor slab insulation, uh, additional costs of about ten to fifteen thousand dollars, and we, they weren't exactly sure yet. But we we gave a pre-approval on that. I believe that's going to be um, on the uh, on the agenda, along with a couple of other deductions and additions at our next board meeting for the next change order that's coming up. But we we needed to get that pre-approval, and that that was pretty much it on on the construction of that facility, and that concludes my report. Okay. Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Tuesday the 1st, I, uh, after our commission meeting, I went over to the 19-night burger cook-off at the Law Enforcement Center, and congratulations to Chief Justin Vogel from Glendon. He won this year's coveted award for the best burger. Um, had a good chance to meet with uh, some of the law enforcement folks over there and uh, some interesting discussions about some of the funding that's available that we'll be looking at in the next several weeks. Uh, Thursday the 3rd attended the Greater Fargo-Moorhead EDC Executive Committee meeting. Um, we had a discussion on the new Governance Committee. This is something we had a vote of the whole board back in June. There's going to be a change in govern, governance structure. Uh, one of the things is we will no longer have a position on the executive committee. We will have one commission uh, uh, position on the board. They're, they're moving to a model that basically, with the exception of Cass County, um, is really putting an emphasis on the private sector. 
Uh, Cass County, by virtue of North Dakota law, uh, is capable of and now is going to be able to collect a levy for um, job development. And there is a great deal of state funding coming in through the county for business uh, investment that the county will have control over, a Cass County will have control over. So uh, there was a pretty good discussion on that. Um, and I, I will say at one point, um, Commissioner Peterson from Cass County brought up his desire and, and the need to emphasize Minnesota partners, even though there's no way uh, with the lack of funding from the state that we're gonna be able to participate at the level that North Dakota partners are now. So that's gonna be a discussion down the road. Uh, there has been an expression of a desire to keep the Minnesota partnership engaged and that's something we're probably gonna have discussions on here prior to budget. Um, another uh, area we covered was Fargo Dome Convention Center. Uh, they're looking at a hotel, motel tax, plus a sales tax to build a convention center and make uh, some pretty large improvements to the Far uh, Fargo Dome. Uh, EDC, uh, the, the executive director wanted to know what level of participation uh, the board would be com comfortable with. And we have no problem with um, his participation directly on this project and um, support for the taxes that are coming up, but there will be no financial assistance with the group that's moving forward on this from the EDC. Uh, it's public funds and they can't be used for this, for uh, pushing the agenda of a sales tax. Uh, we also discussed Cass County had a budget meeting and they directed $800,000 into several projects over there. Again, most of them are gonna be North Dakota. Uh, discussed the Fueling Our Future 2.0 and uh, basically the idea was by the end of the year, there would either be proper support and interest expressed uh, by by the the uh, businesses and chamber and uh, EDC to support this or not, and it'll probably dissolve after the first of the year. Uh, there does not seem to be enough of the, enough interest in it to to make it make a go of it. Um, and that concludes that meeting. Later that day, I attended virtually the uh, Emergency Communication uh, Board's legislative, legislative and Governance Committee. Uh, we're, we're preparing for the 2024 legislative session. There are a couple of deadlines. I won't go into the weeds on this, uh, that some of the, the policy recommendations needed to get in and it's uh, by August 18th that's being worked on. The uh, Chapter 403 subcommittee, again, to try and work at some revisions on our state law that controls the Emergency Communication Board. Uh, we will be starting meeting two times a month, probably through October, to review what we submitted last time and to try and work with some of the service providers to see if we can come up with something that'll get through the legislature next session. That's gonna be a work in progress. Uh, we've been working on a public safety telecommunicator certification and training roadmap. Uh, basically our, our dispatch center personnel, they're now called public safety telecommunicators as opposed to dispatchers or call takers. But it is a profession and we need to start treating it that way. They're going to be getting a requirement for certification, just like law enforcement has its licensure in Minnesota or certification in North Dakota. And uh, that needs to come with mandated training. So we have pretty much worked out a roadmap on that and hopefully it'll get through the legislature. And uh, 
following that, it was a busy, busy day Thursday, I attended the uh, Metro Flood Diversion Authority Lunch and Learn session we had at Fargo City Hall. Uh, it was on funding and finance. It was very informative. This is uh, stuff that as a board member, I really appreciate having it uh, kind of ground down into detail, but I will not share those details with this group because it was pretty dry as most of these meetings are, but it was good information to help with decisions we make as board members. And that concludes my report. Thank you. All? Darn button. Uh, uh, I too, uh, as mentioned earlier, joined in the law enforcement murder <coughs> cook-off. Um, it was uh, good to see a room full of our uh, law enforcement people uh, throughout the community, and uh, uh, it was just nice to <coughs> have that event and enjoyed being there. Uh, Meeting-wise, um, on Wednesday, Commissioner <coughs> Campbell did a very good report on our uh, Clay County Insurance Group. Uh, look forward to our next meeting on August 22nd, where some final recommendations will be coming toward us. And then on um, Thursday, I traveled to uh, the St. Cloud area for a day of uh, uh, AMC, the Association of Minnesota Counties, Government 201. Um, in January, I'd been to a similar event that was a 101, and that was just uh, uh, when I was brand new, and that was just for new commissioners that time. This, uh, this one, about two-thirds were new commissioners. Then we had <coughs> HR people. Um, we also had uh, administrators and as well as some more experienced uh, commissioners in the room. And I think there were roughly about 80 uh, in the room. So good, uh, mainly four topic points that I'll just uh, briefly mention. Number one, uh, Commissioner Mojo uh, presented the first one. And it was just talk, you know, mainly about you know, our board responsibilities, how we work out in the community, Speaking as, you know, as I speak, I have my own personal opinions, but I, when I speak to uh, what Clay County is doing, I speak as the board. And, and uh, I thought that, I thought it was very good. And thank you, Jenny, for that. Um, you guys do a great job as well as your counterpart. Uh, I really was impressed by her too. And it was, uh, uh, she was a Candy, uh, Candy Ohio. Uh, county administrator that as um, her and Jenny did that together is very good. Uh, one I re also really enjoyed was we did uh, scenarios with uh, human services in in two aspects. Number one, you know we have a lot of employees in Clay County, six hundred and some, and HR deals with all that. What about when we know people that are employees and they have a gripe that's not getting settled by HR? What do we do? How do we handle that, those type things? And of course, we always talk to our administrator and he takes care of it for us, right? Yeah, but uh, it, it was about that pro protocol. So uh, just went through that. That was, uh, and then also, um, if it was, had to do with wages or those types of things, just remember that we're, we're also dealing with unions. So uh, being very careful as a commissioner. Uh, the second, uh, the third was on an open meeting law. I've been through that probably uh, three, four times uh, between the association and then uh, MCTI. So, or M MCIT, I should say. But uh, um, anyway, that was good. And then the last piece uh, that we went into that I thought was very interesting. If it, uh, just talk about it a little bit, and it's our citizens to be heard. It's about our public comments. And uh, um, I, I just think whatever this structure is here, how we handle it as a board, administration, uh, so much of it is about the communication that happens before the meeting. That's what I think, you know. When we get a call, getting into our specific areas, whether it's uh, directly to our administrator, highway department, settling those type, you know, bringing information, point and direction where they can go, go to so it doesn't elevate. But there are always going to be certain political things that come up that can kind of fill the room a little bit and people are upset. And 
how do we deal with that? And my uh, background for the you know years with uh, Clay County and planning and zoning, I think the structure we have here is excellent, and I think we de deal with it as well, limiting people's time so it's not repeated over and over again. And but we need to have you know our citizens have a a right to speak, and we need to listen respectfully and deliberate respectfully to to what they're talking about. I thought that was very good. Hennepin County, and I'm sure it's because of all of what happened a couple of years ago in the city and the ongoings, they've closed public comments. And uh, uh, a lot of people were shocked by that. Some people put it at the end of the meeting, some put it at the beginning. I think the way we do it, one example this morning, and that was excellent. We have a citizen comes in, and, you know, we try to help them the best we can, and can't always have the you know solve it, uh, the problem. Maybe the way all people like, but we do the best we can and we'll be listening res respectfully and make adjustments when we can. So, with that, that's it. I had those two meetings. A couple others were canceled because of uh, not having enough people attending and or uh, not enough business to talk about. So. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Gross. I also attended the uh, DMV construction scheduling meeting that happened last week on the 1st. Commissioner Campbell encapsulated that well. And then, uh, as Commissioner Kravinov reported on, I did present at the AMC on County Government 201. So, grateful for the opportunity to share what's been working in Clay County with others as they can decipher whether they want to apply that in their counties uh, or not. So that concludes my reports. Okay. I too attended the burgers. Um, I do want to congratulate Justin, but I don't know whose burger I got when I went through the line. So I don't know if we got the good ones or not or what the deal was. <laughs> anyway, it was a good burger, a good time. I was just glad to see so many people participate in that. That was a good crowd over there. And I was glad to see our county and group was there and a lot of other groups were there too. So I was glad to see that. After that, I went to DMV retirement. Marcy retired from there after, I think she had 18 years, 17, 18 years in there and she retired from the, from the motor vehicle. And last night I was at the Yule and City Council meeting, big discussion on the water district up there, participating in that. In that. And they're very concerned about Casa 34, going through town and going east of town. and. Uh, as Justin presented today, that they're going to be working on that possibly next year, or whatever. So, whenever we get that on the five-year plan, so oh, that was that, Steve. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I also participated in the United Night Burger Cookoff. I was I echo the comments that have been made. I, I participated in the DMV construction timeline meeting that uh, has been addressed by Commissioner Campbell. Uh, that afternoon, I also uh, had a web meeting with Derek Lapointe and uh, Corey Hapola from Brookshire Company. Uh, their company provides a variety of different <coughs> services on economic development uh, that focuses specifically on rural communities uh, and business searches. Um, and the, the second met with Justin Sorum, uh, got an update on a personnel update. Uh, again, we talked a little bit about uh, his budget, uh, uh, budget and also talked about uh, what steps need to get to be taken for uh, to find, if we can't find an assistant, uh, what can be done to, uh, to help uh, mitigate all the great work that he does and also talked about the uh, road closure uh, project that started last week last week on um, 70th street north to highway 9. Uh, again the anticipated uh, detour is going to go till august 25th there on the second we also uh, talked to social services uh, did the pre-budget that you heard this morning uh, we also participated in the clay county insurance committee uh, that has been uh, been addressed uh, we had done the second also lit, went, met with Joe and Lori on the pre-budget for the facilities that you heard this morning. Uh, Lori and I continued on with some of the discussions for the uh, board presentation this morning. Uh, and the third, uh, we also, I also talked with Ben Madsen from Construction Engineers uh, with, uh, they're starting to wrap up on the projects uh, out there and so they're looking to finalize some of the outstanding uh, change orders that we have and so we'll have some ongoing discussions uh, with Commissioner Campbell, Commissioner Mojo, 
uh, and Corey in regards to that moving forward. I would just note a couple different things. I did talk to to Jay, Joe Rezo. Uh, he is going to come before our board on July, or excuse me, September 12th. Um, just to kind of probably provide an over, overview uh, and also probably talk about a funding request for next year. Uh, as was mentioned by Rocky this morning, uh, just looking for your guys' feedback. I know uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Gross and Commissioner Campbell are not able to make the Northwest Senate bonding tour on the 16th at 1030 to 1130. But if we had interest um, to have more than two, uh, two, two commissioners there, we could certainly get that advertised. And then I think you all received an invitation. Tomorrow there's going to be a drug court graduation in courtroom six uh, at 1.30. Uh, and that concludes my report. You just mentioned that tour, the Buffalo River tour. Um, that's, oh, wait a minute. That's the same day, the 16th. Yeah, on the 16th. I, I have to withdraw from that one. So if someone else wants to go with it, we don't have to advertise or whatever. But... Uh, Okay. 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 Anything? Okay. Thank you. We're adjourned.